Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition on behalf of the residents uh, of Lunenburg County. The operative clause is, we, the undersigned concerned citizens, demand that the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal change the dust control policy to ensure that there will be dust control every time the roads are graded, summer, spring and fall, not just for summer grading. Consistent with the rules of the House, Mr. Speaker, I've affixed my name to that petition. The petition is tabled. We'll now move on to presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations and other papers. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to uh, table a document entitled Nova Scotia's Culture Action Plan, Creativity, Community, and in both, I have French and English versions as well as the plan's executive summaries in English, French, Mi'kmaq, Gaelic, Arabic, and Mandarin. The report is tabled. Statements by Ministers. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to point out that today, Mr. Speaker, uh, marks a very important day for a number of us in this House. It happens to be the 10th anniversary uh, of the member for Annapolis, his, his uh, taking on the leadership of this party. And I want to thank him for his service over the last 10 years. Some of us have walked that uh, walk with him. Some of us came along later. Uh, and we always knew that it was a privilege to serve with this man as leader. We've laughed together. Uh, sometimes we've cried together, some of us crying more than others. Um, <laughs> but what, was, what always came through, what always shone through, was this member's care for the, how much he cared for the uh, less fortunate, how much he thought about that. There are so many times where I thought I had a handle on a file, and then he would say, but what about this? He would, he would give me a new way of looking at things, and it always brought more clarity to the situation, and I want to thank him for that. And that we, as caucus members, we always knew that we could always reach out to him, that he was at the other end of the line if, if we needed to talk to him. He's never forgotten where he, he's, he comes from. And I don't know, Mr. Speaker, uh, what, what uh, we're supposed to get someone for 10th anniversary. I can't remember if it's wood or paper or whatever. Uh, but uh, I, I, oh, oh, apparently it's scotch. Uh, I, I just... <laughs> But I do, I do want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for Annapolis for his service over the last 10 years and for the privilege of serving alongside him. We'll now move on to government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to have to come back to that. I am so sorry. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I do uh, my resolution, can I do an introduction? Permission granted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw the attention of the House uh, to the East Gallery. We have with us some very special Nova Scotians who have been a uh, tremendous example for all of us, and I'd like them to stand as I introduce their names. Uh, Daniel Martin, uh, he's a snowshoer. Robert Fougier is a figure skating. Kaylee Stewart in figure skating. Brianna Harris in snowshoeing. And Marianne Crawley's there, who is a coach of uh, extraordinary time. She doesn't want me to say how long she's been coaching, uh, but she's given a tremendous amount of her, of her adult life. Uh, to coaching Special Olympics and we are so grateful for you and the athletes are so much better for it. I also want to acknowledge uh, two people who couldn't be here, which is Amy Gordon and, their co and, her, and another coach, Cyril McDonald, who couldn't join us today. 
but I want uh, the host to give these uh, special Nova Scotians a warm welcome. <laughs> The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Where today we celebrate Nova Scotia Special Olympic athletes and their success at the 2017 World Games in Austria. And whereas through the hard work and dedication of Amy, Daniel, Robert, Kaylee, Brianna, and their coach Marianne and Cyril, they brought home 11 medals to Nova Scotia. Whereas these athletes have accomplished extraordinary personal goals, setting a great example for all Nova Scotians by demonstrating the Special Olympic motto, let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. Therefore, be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly and all Nova Scotians join me in congratulating the athletes, their coaches, their families for, for an outstanding effort, for their achievement, and for the love of sport. And quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, for being great role models for all Nova Scotians. I ask for waiver and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotians recognize the National Day of Mourning every year on April 28th, a day to pause and pay respect to those who lost their lives or were seriously injured on the job. And whereas we honour the 20 Nova Scotians who lost their lives as a result of workplace injury or illness last year, leaving heartbroken families and loved ones behind. And whereas today is a day to remember those individuals and reaffirm our shared commitment to spare other families from this heartache. Therefore, be it resolved, all members of this House stand united at today's Day of Mourning ceremony and that we continue to raise awareness of the importance of workplace safety and commend the tremendous efforts of so many to better protect workers across the province. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas culture is the heart and soul of our communities and seeps into every aspect of our lives, and whereas the province recently released Nova Scotia's first comprehensive strategy to celebrate and share our culture, our creative sector, and our diverse communities, and whereas Nova Scotia's Culture Action Plan takes an inclusive approach towards culture and an approach that promotes creativity and innovation, advances cultural diversity, and grows our creative economy so we can keep our community strong and vibrant. Therefore, be it resolved that every member in this House and the members in Nova Scotians across the province take the time to read Nova Scotia's Culture Action Plan creativity and community to better understand the important role culture plays in the lives of Nova Scotians and our creative economy. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. And I will read it in both English and French. Whereas we have a big opportunity to welcome more French-speaking immigrants to Nova Scotia, whereas the Office of Immigration and Office of Acadian Affairs are currently working on a new joint strategy on Francophone attraction, 
whereas I recently had the opportunity to share some of our plans at a historic first conference of federal, provincial, and territorial ministers responsible for the ministries of immigration and the Canadian Francophonie in Moncton, New Brunswick. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this legislature join me in thanking the government of New Brunswick for hosting this historic summit and thank my colleagues from across the country for helping shape our strategy. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. Je donne avis par la présente que, dans un futur jour, je proposerai l'adoption de la résolution suivante. Attendu que nous avons une grande opportunité d'accueillir plus d'immigrants francophones en Nouvelle-Écosse, attendons que l'Office de l'immigration et l'Office des affaires acadiennes et de la francophonie travaillent actuellement à une nouvelle stratégie commune sur l'attraction de francophones. Attendu que j'ai récemment eu l'occasion de partager certains de nos projets lors d'une première réunion historique des ministres fédéraux, provinciaux et territoriaux responsables de l'immigration et de la francophonie à Moncton, au New Brunswick. Par conséquent, il est résolu que tous les membres de cette Assemblée législative se joignent à moi pour remercier le gouvernement de Nouveau-Brunswick d'avoir accueilli ce sommet historique et remercier mes collègues de tout le pays pour avoir contribué à façonner notre stratégie. Monsieur le Président, je demande la renonciation à la vie et à son adoption, son débat. Merci. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed, but all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary mind and nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotia has made a sincere and heartfelt commitment to implement and honour the Truth and Reconciliation Calls for Action and the Donald Marshall Jr. Inquiry Report recommendations, and whereas it is a priority of this government to make the Nova, the Nova Scotia justice system more responsive to the needs of First Nations communities and their people, and whereas the Department of Justice this past week in Wagmacook First Nation was proud to announce Nova Scotia's very first Gladue Court that will also have a wellness court and regular provincial court services for the residents of Victoria County. Therefore, be it resolved that we all join together to thank and commend all of our community and justice partners, especially Chief Norman Bernard of Wagmacook and Chief Rod Gugu of Waikaba, for their leadership and advocacy in helping bring these unique, culturally sensitive court services to Wagmacook and the surrounding communities. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver and, or sorry, waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction before reading my statement. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to draw your attention and the attention of the colleagues in the House to the East Gallery where we have with us today Shing Pei Sun, the founder of UB Life, a Halifax-based company. Shing Pei came to Nova Scotia to attend university, earning an undergraduate and a master's degree in economics from Dalhousie University. Since graduating, she has started her own business. I ask Shing Pei to stand, which she has, and remain standing. Uh, she is also joined uh, in the gallery by her partner, Shen, her lawyer, Liz Wozniak, business consultant, Fox Leo, as well as some staff from the Office of Immigration who played key roles in designing and implementing the International Graduate Entrepreneur Stream. I want to welcome Natalie Silver, Business Stream Officer, Colin Brothers, Senior Business Officer, Rachel Henderson, Director of Strategic Policy and External Relations, and my Executive Secretary, Sandra Bennett. Mr. Speaker, I ask all my colleagues in the House to please give them the very warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. 
Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas we are fortunate to have thousands of international students coming to Nova Scotia each year to attend our post-secondary institutions. Whereas I am so proud of the work of our government and the Nova Scotia Office of Immigration in creating a number of immigration pathways, and in particular, a new immigration stream in 2016 for international students with entrepreneurial spirit to stay in Nova Scotia after graduation and start businesses here. Whereas this week we nominated Xing Pei Sun, a graduate of Dalhousie, the founder of UB Life, Halifax-based web company that is already employing four people and the first nominee through our international graduate entrepreneur stream for permanent residency. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this legislature join me in thanking Shin Pei Sun for choosing to live, work, and contribute to our Nova Scotia economy and congratulate her for being the first person nominated for permanent residency through our international graduate entrepreneur stream. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> we'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction before I introduce my bill. Permission granted. Uh, I would like to direct the members' attention to the East Gallery today, we, where we are joined by Janet Hazelton, who, uh, many, who many in this house would know very well as the president of the Nova Scotia Nurses Union. And with her today is Tim Tokars, who is a nurse from Ontario. Uh, he was here in Nova Scotia this week uh, speaking to the Nurses uh, Union uh, annual general meeting in in Truro, where he was speaking about PTSD, and uh, I want to uh, welcome them, ask them to rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 10 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Workers' Compensation Act. The Honourable Minister of Labour begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 10 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Workers' Compensation Act. Bill number 90, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 10 of the Acts of 1994-95, the Workers' Compensation Act. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Minister of Finance on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just uh, like to direct uh, the members' attention to the East Gallery uh, up there joining uh, some of the representatives from the Nova Scotia Nurses Union uh, that were previously introduced uh, uh, is uh, Dr. Paul uh, Curry, a former resident uh, from Anakinish, who I'd like to uh, uh, recognize he does uh, research uh, services and a lot of uh, work uh, with the Nova Scotia Nurses Union. Uh, so if people could uh, rise and uh, receive the warm welcome of the House. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadamid Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today is a solemn occasion. It's the day of mourning. Every year we set aside this day to pay tribute to those who have died or have been injured at work. Mr. Speaker, it only takes a fraction of a second to change a life or a family forever. It is those lives and those families who are in our thoughts today. There are many employers, unions and businesses who work very hard to reduce the number of workplace accidents in our province. And we salute them just as we salute hardworking, resilient Nova Scotians. When they leave their homes in the morning, they expect to return at the end of the day. We as legislators, legislators must do all we can to make sure that they return to their families safely. 
we have to minimize the number of times a fraction of a second changes the course of someone's life. So today, Nova Scotians who were injured or lost their lives on the job and their families, they're in our thoughts and they're in our prayers. We must do everything we can to ensure their lives were not lost in vain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, the Liberal government promised a doctor for every Nova Scotian. But there was something missing at the end of this sentence that is key to that promise. And that is, when, Mr. Speaker? They could have said in five to ten years, as the member from Claire Digby has said, suggested, but did not, Mr. Speaker. Even if they had suggested that a timeline, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure that they could have met it by failing to recruit, recruit doctors and withholding billing numbers, the province has been headed in the wrong direction and taken the Liberal promise with it. Now, here we are on the eve of election with more Liberal promises to recruit doctors. They've been there, Mr. Speaker, but they have not done that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Raylene Way for her outstanding service to our community. Raylene recently received the Police Officer of the Year Award from the Halifax Regional Police Force for her amazing work with various community groups in the Fairview Clayton Park area. Her service is truly an inspiration to all aspiring police officers and her work ethic and willingness to go above and beyond the call of duty should be an inspiration to us all. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you and the members of this House join me in thanking Officer Way for her amazing service and wishing her only the best for her future endeavours. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a young woman from Foxbrook Road has launched a lipstick line named after the road where she grew up. Catherine Millen knows that big things can come from small places. She believes women feel better about themselves when they look their best. Since lipstick is the quickest way to add a little color, she designed lipstick colors tailored to individual women. Plus, Aesthetic Studio reached out to Catherine to carry Foxbrook lipstick after only her third week in business. Now she is looking to expand her business into other parts of Nova Scotia. I'm thrilled that another small business in Picto East is off to a successful beginning, and I wish Catherine all the best moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, the Atlantic Journalism Awards will be handed out next Saturday in St. John's, Newfoundland. Six of the nominations are for journalists from the local Express, who have been on strike from the Chronicle Herald for 15 months. Journalism, like our job in this House, is essential for democracy. And for that matter, collective bargaining and respect for unions is core to democracy as well. We have felt a void these past 15 months with the absence of a quality daily provincial newspaper. That absence will be felt more keenly in the election campaign that I assume is about to kick off. But what can we expect when this Premier has led by such poor example in the area of labour relations? Is it any wonder that we've seen no resolution in the Chronicle Herald strike if employers follow this Premier's lead? I congratulate the members of the Halifax Typographical Union and thank them for their work. Uh, thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Picto West on an introduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In the West Gallery, I have a constituent of mine that I would like uh, for her to rise, Heather Morrissey, who is here today, is an uh, advocate for bees and is a bee lover, and as well as I'd like to say that uh, last week media deemed her road in rural Nova Scotia as the road to hell. It is a road that we can't even get trucks to go down anymore. So anyway, warm welcome to Heather. Thank you for coming. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Gary L. Wenzel Hockey Tournament has become one of the largest rural hockey tournaments in Atlantic Canada. With more than 50 teams participating in the five-day tournament, 94 games were played at the Lunenburg County Lifestyle Center, the Lunenburg Memorial Arena, and Queen's Place Amira Center, a great example of regional cooperation. Three host teams were able to earn championship banners in the Adam A, Pee Wee A, and Pee Wee A divisions. Mr. Speaker, it takes many volunteer hours and coordination to be able to put a tournament of this size together. 
More than 60 hockey moms and dads, community members, and others did everything from sell 50-50 tickets, look after score sheets and clock keeping, answering questions and giving directions. I think it's safe to say the tournament was a success. This would not have been possible without the leadership of Devin Nogler and his team. Many thanks to the volunteers, the rink staff, officials, players and parents who have helped make this a tournament that is very successful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make two introductions. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, in the West Gallery you'll find Tom Cosman of uh, Cosman and Widden uh, Beekeeping in uh, Kings County. I'm pleased to say he lives on a very good road in Highway 1. <laughs> Tom is one of the leading beekeepers in the province, and you'll find his honey, Cosman, and Witten brand throughout the province. Um, seated next to Tom is uh, Perry Brandt of Wolfel, and Perry is uh, a beekeeper too. He has over 100 hives and uh, is a bee inspector and has on occasion advised me on my four beehives. And I'm pleased to uh, 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 ask the House to give them the, the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, the beekeeping industry in Nova Scotia is too important for our provincial government to risk importing a pest. With more than adequate uh, hive numbers in the province, there is no need to import bees from small hive beetle infested southern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I call on the Minister of Agriculture to do the right thing and say no to importation of hives for blueberry pollination this year. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, beekeepers in Nova Scotia are alarmed by an application currently sitting with the Minister of Agriculture to import beehives from Ontario, where a small hive bee infestation has been on a path of destruction. They are concerned that if this import permit is approved, this infestation could spread to Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, this beetle lives in the cluster and even through an inspection process, it's very difficult to ensure that all of these beetles are found. Mr. Speaker, bees are important pollinators, particularly for our blueberry industry. I call on the Minister to reject this application to import hives from Ontario, as it's just not worth it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Just before we go on to the next member statement, I'll take the opportunity to make a brief introduction up in uh, my gallery, the Speaker's Gallery. We have with us here today, uh, many of the members know, my legislative assistant that works downstairs, keeps me on the straight and narrow, Mr. Scott Burke is here with us today. And uh, joining Scott is my part-time CA from the beautiful Eastern Shore, Miss Holly Quick. Thank you for coming in today. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Mr. Dave Weir from Newport Station. On Thursday, April the 20th, Dave was visiting his good friend John Geddes in Eller's house. John had been burning some debris out back in his yard and realized the fire had gotten away from him. Dave immediately jumped into action knowing what to do and beating the fire out. As John describes himself, although he's lived in Ellers House for some years now, he describes himself as a city boy who didn't quite know what to do in this circumstance where you had a grass fire now out of control. Dave jumped right on it, immediately beating the fire out and probably saved it from going into the woods and maybe nearby houses. And I wanted to stand today, take a moment to uh, recognize Dave and thank him for that great effort in helping John and his uh, local neighbors out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictner West. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to rise today to congratulate Picto resident Allison Arsenault for being chosen as the 2017 Picto Volunteer of the Year. Allison has a long history of volunteering with Boxing Nova Scotia. She judged bouts from 1975 until 2011, held the position of Vice President for Administration for 24 years, was a member of the Women in Boxing Commission, and holds lifetime memberships to Boxing Nova Scotia and Boxing Canada. Allison has volunteered with the New Horizons Club in Picto, serving as director and as a rental chairperson. She has assisted with the club's newsletter, organized cribbage games, and helped with potlucks and pancake breakfasts. Allison also helps fundraise for the Christmas Daddies and the IWK, and she is involved with the Picto United Church's Grab and Go School Lunch Program. Mr. Speaker, I thank Allison for her volunteering and congratulate her on being Picto's Volunteer of the Year. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill Millbrook Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Dance is the hidden language of the soul of the body, Mr. Speaker. So said the trailblazing modern dancer, Martha Graham. This week is National Dance Week, and I want to acknowledge those in all of our communities who celebrate that hidden language. In September of this year, the Cobequid Dance Academy in Truro will be celebrating its 20th anniversary of introducing the world of dance to so many young people in Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, and Salmon River. Started by Mar Margot Beijing as the Truro Dance Academy, many of its students have gone on to pursue careers in performing arts, and it has hosted master teachers from across the country, and its annual Nutcracker performance is a holiday season favorite. During this week, I want to thank all of the teachers and the dancers at the CDA for expressing that hidden language of the soul of the body in our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is an amazing accomplishment when members of a community lend their time and resources bonding together to raise money for a great cause. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize the organizers and volunteers of the annual Berg Classic Charity Hockey Tournament in Lunenburg. This year was the fifth year of its operation, growing into 16 teams from four in its initial year. The tournament took place at the Lunenburg County Lifestyle Centre and was a weekend-long event accompanied by a silent auction and a dance. This year, the charity hockey tournament event raised over $24,500, a new record high for the event. All of the proceeds raised will help 10 local recipients in need. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that you and the members of this House of Assembly please join me in recognizing the organizers and volunteers of the Berg Classic Charity Hockey Tournament and wishing them continued success in the years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the North Sydney Volunteer Fire Department on their new additions. Two new vehicles, a pumper and a three-ton vehicle to help fight grass fires, will soon be arriving along with a relatively new second-hand aerial truck. Fundraising will allow the department to upgrade its jaws of life, purchase a new generator, and in the near future obtain a new support truck. It's a pleasure to live and represent a community that supports its volunteer firefighters and gives them the tools they need to protect lives and property. A big salute goes out to Chief McIntosh and his department. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Mr. Speaker, it's often been said that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Now, while I risk showing my age here in this house, I can remember when rum and nylons were the norm around election time. Sure, times have changed, Mr. Speaker, but old habits die hard. Mr. Speaker, the spending spree of this government on the eve of election is as transparent as a pair of nylons and as hard to swallow as a shot of rum. Mr. Speaker, Liberals now have to certainly know how to grease wheels. Unfortunately, you can't do it without getting your hands dirty along the way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Ring 73 Boxing Club out of Glace Bay has a storied history of developing quality boxers and quality people for decades. Dozens of fighters, including my best friend, John John McCarthy, have experienced national and international success under the Ring 73 banner. But perhaps more importantly, the club's coaching staff allows young athletes to channel their emotions towards something positive and build on an incredible skill. That tradition continues this week in Quebec City when Jonathan Sinclair, Josh Prince and Matt McDonald compete at the Canadian Boxing Championships. We wish the boys the very best of luck and we know they will represent us proudly like the generations of boxers who paved their way. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2014, when this government killed the refundable credit for the film industry, thereby damaging the industry, the Premier said that $24 million was too rich. The film industry was greedy. In 2014, the cost of that credit was $24 million. We lost experienced producers and crew, small and independent filmmakers, the next generation, and young people who we des desperately need to stay and raise families here have left or are being left behind. 
but the damage control has been underway. The government committed more than $24 million this year. It is obvious the government made a huge mistake. The industry is smaller, but hopefully resilient enough to survive this government. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, I would like to share... I would like to share a Sterling Bellevauism with the members of the House who don't have the benefit of receiving his advice in our caucus meetings. There is no I in team. I am grateful that my time with the Nova Scotia NDP has overlapped with the member for Queen Shelburne. In the House and in our caucus meetings, he is a grounded voice of good sense and the big picture. Likewise, I am grateful to have been here with the member for Clayton Park West in her role as Minister of Justice. The best work of the House that I have witnessed has been under her guidance. I wish both members the very best and I thank them for their welcome to the House and for their example. I'd just like to remind the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham not to refer to other members by their proper name. He's still a member, he, still for a little while yet. A Sterling Bellevaux-ism. I got gotcha. you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is an interesting place. Some people call it theater. Yesterday, we got to witness a comedy act. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, the member from Truro Bible Hill got up and claimed the NDP balanced the budget, Mr. Speaker. I've never heard anything so comedic in my life. But Mr. Speaker, I would like to say they did table a balanced budget, but Nova Scotians soon came to find out it was $500 million in the hole. And Mr. Speaker, when they posed this budget to Nova Scotians that was the farthest thing from balance, I want to point out one thing. A $30 million cut to income assistance, and I will table that. The NDP government cut $30 million, 10%, to the most vulnerable people in Nova Scotia. They cut out a whole month of income assistance payments. Shame on you. Order, right please. Here. I'd like to remind the Honourable Member not to refer to members opposite directly with the word you. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Mr. Speaker, a 69-year-old sailor is lucky to be alive after being rescued from his disabled sailboat in the 50-knot wind and 30-foot seas last November. Eric Nickerson is a crew member on board the Coast, Cutter, Coast Guard Cutter Spray. He was instrumental in the rescue, putting his life on the line to assist the rescue. Although he doesn't consider himself a hero, he definitely went above and beyond to save this man's life. So please join me in congratulating Eric Nickerson for answering the call of duty and risking his own life to save another. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, it seems to me that this government believes that the people of this province have short memories. The Liberals spent yesterday setting off fireworks to celebrate their dedication to the creative industries. They were tripping over themselves to praise the working people they've disrespected time and time again. The same industries they've starved over the last three and a half years. Well, Mr. Speaker, the people of this province haven't forgotten how the Liberals went to the juggler and eliminated the film tax credit, rather than supporting an industry that was thriving and punching above its weight. Nova Scotia's creative economy is now on life support. If the Premier thinks that our memories can be erased by vague promises of cultural funding, he should think again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate Dingwall resident Daniel Murray, who recently returned from Sweden after completing the world's longest, oldest, and biggest cross-country ski race. Mr. Murray, who has been on skis since childhood and trains at home year-round, placed 881 out of 15,800 participants. Mr. Speaker, I wish to congratulate Daniel on his tremendous accomplishments and wish him continued success and the best of luck in the future. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, I wish to direct the attention of the House to the West Gallery where we have Amanda Brule of Nova Solar Capital of Kenful, Nova Scotia. 
Uh, Nova Solar Capital is offering an RRSP eligible CDF which homeowners can use to put solar panels on their own homes. Please uh, give Amanda the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honour a young woman from Canning. Lily Bateman is a grade 12 student at Northeast Kings Education Centre who was chosen to receive the Loran Scholarship. She will receive $100,000 over four years for undergraduate studies as well as mentorship and summer experiences. The Financial Post recently named the Loran Scholars Foundation a top 25 Canadian charity, number one in education, based on evidence of good governance, financial transparency and clear evidence of impact. Ms. Bateman is involved in the Jane Goodall Roots and Shoots program as well as Light for Learning and serves as a junior board member with the Community Association of People for Real Enterprise, Capri. Mr. Speaker, I congratulate Lily Bateman for receiving this scholarship and looking forward to following her career as she is a truly remarkable young woman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to take a moment to talk about April the Giraffe. The proud mother was live-streamed for weeks while the world watched with anticipation the arrival of her calf. Located in upstate New York, the Animal Adventure Park welcomed the baby boy on Saturday, April the 15th. The calf weighed 129 pounds and stood 5 feet 9 inches tall at birth. It is estimated that more than 1.2 million viewers, viewers turned in to watch the birth. That is the second most live viewed channel in YouTube's history. The first being League of Legends eSports, which has been around since 2012. Since February, April's live stream had more than 232 million views and 7.6 billion minutes of live watch time, as said by YouTube. 15-year-old April had the, the baby with first-time father Oliver, a five-year-old giraffe. While this is April's fourth calf, male giraffes, according to an Animal Adventure Park, only rarely care about two things, the first being fighting and I will leave the other to your imagination. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate author Leslie Crew of Homeville on the launch of her newest book, Mary Mary. Leslie Crew is also the author of several novels, including Relatively Happiness, Relative Happiness, sorry, which has been adapted into a feature film. Today, Mr. Speaker, I wish to congratulate Leslie Crew and offer her all the best as I'm sure we will continue to hear more of her stories and we will hear, see many more novels from Leslie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to tell you about Shirley Lafitte. Shirley Lafitte has been nominated for the, for the CEO Award of Excellence with Ocean View Continuing Care Centre. Shirley was nominated by her co-workers for consistently going above and beyond to ensure the comfort and contentment of the residents. Shirley cares for the residents as though they were her own family. She is always deeply and sincerely concerned about their well-being. She is well known for her positivity, honesty and team spirit. Shirley never misses a chance to make each resident feel special. Mr. Speaker, I ask that all members of this House of Assembly to congratulate Shirley Lafitte on a job well done. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, congratulations to Paul McIsaac of Port Hood who was inducted into the Dr. Hugh A. Noble Hall of Honour by the Nova Scotia Teachers Association of Physical and Health Education. Paul had a teaching career that lasted 34 years, primarily in Port Hood. In demonstrating the spirit of the Dr. Nobel Award, Paul made tremendous efforts on behalf of his colleagues and students. Dr. Noble is considered by many to be the father of physical education in our province. He was elegant, articulate, and a charismatic leader for physical education and sport. He was a role model for many, and so Paul has been during his career. Let us congratulate Paul. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Whitney Pier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in my place uh, to recognize the St. Joseph's Lebanese and Syrian Benevolent Society in Sydney, who for over 100 years has supported, uh, celebrated and protected uh, the Lebanese and Syrian culture uh, in the CBRM and across the island. Um, they've done tremendous work in the community supporting Syrian refugees, and their Cedars Club, uh, located in Sydney, has been a community centre for many years to support organizations uh, throughout the community. Uh, it's been a challenge uh, for the society since the Thanksgiving Day flood, but this week, uh, through perseverance of their board and their president, they received very good news that will allow them to continue to celebrate the traditions of the Lebanese and Syrian families in Cape Breton for a hundred years more. So I rise in my place today as the MLA to congratulate the St. Joseph's Lebanese and Syrian Benevolent Society on their hard work and their commitment to protecting and celebrating the Lebanese and Syrian culture in Cape Breton. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, every year our municipalities honour some of the many volunteers and choose one to represent the group at a provincial ceremony. The following are the three from my riding and a short description of some of the things these people do for their communities. Oliver Jansen of the town of Digby, who has had a tremendous impact on the sporting community, coaching soccer, track and field and cross country, as well as being one of the founders of the Digby Scallop Fun Run. Over the years, he's been part of a number of organizations and boards. Shirley Dugaw of the municipality has volunteered much time for the Admiral Digby Museum and Historical Society's genealogy, as well as for the Girl Guides and the Bear of United Baptist Church. And Marie Saunier of the municipality of Clare has been an avid volunteer at the Sacre Coeur Church in Saunierville serving on several of the communities and organization fundraisers as a parish picnic. She also volunteers at the food bank. The ceremony by the province permits us to show our appreciation and highlight the importance of volunteering. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Let us acknowledge Gabriel McIsaac from Troy for combining his passion for photography and rail art to produce a one-of-a-kind collection. Years ago, working as a rail car inspector at Port Hawkesbury Paper, he began to appreciate spray-painted art on the rail cars. Most of us would have dismissed the creations as just graffiti, but Gabriel saw something more and started taking photos of the cars. That led him to New York to study graffiti art in the 1970s. Over the years, he's taken more than 500 photographs, and his collection is currently on display in the People's Place Library in Antigonish. We look forward to seeing more of Gabriel's work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge Lynette Chesson of Albert Bridge, who was the lone Cape Breton athlete of the, on the Nova Scotia women's volleyball team that competed in the 1987 Jure Canada Games held in Sydney. 37 years ago, the Canadian Games was one of the largest sporting events ever held on the island. Close to 2,000 athletes from across Canada competed in 17 different sports. Today, Lynette coaches girls volleyball both at the Sydney Academy and with Volleyball Cape Breton. The Nova Scotia volley te volleyball team didn't get a medal at the event, Mr. Speaker, but Lynette's fondest memory was the time she spent with her teammates at the Athletes Village at Breton Education Centre. I'm pleased to congratulate and thank Lynette Chesson for her dedication then and now to volleyball in our area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to recognize Gasparo residents, Dr. Wendy Bettingfield, a leader in physical education, sport, and recreation opportunities for women. Beginning her teaching career at Acadia in 1970, Dr. Bettingfield left to earn her PhD in biomechanics and anatomy. In 1981, she helped establish the Canadian Association for the Advancement of Women in Sport. Returning to Acadia in 1986, she was a professor and administrator there until she retired in 2012. Her interest in sport, leadership and gender equity was reflected in her teaching and in her work with provincial, national and international sport organizations. On April 1, she was recognized by Women, Act Women Active Nova Scotia, an organization she helped found with one of its, with one of its second annual Trailblazer Trendsetter Awards. On behalf of the Legislative Assembly of Nova Scotia, I would like to congratulate Dr. Benningfield on this most recent honour and for years of motivating and inspiring sport and recreation professionals to be leaders and agents for change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank Blair McKenzie and the Cape Breton Horsemen's Association and its 200 members for the weekly harness racing at the Northside Downs. It's a monumental task to keep the track and surrounding facilities up and running. Close to 50 people are employed at the track during the season. There is no admission to the track and the owners and trainers welcome people to, into the barns to meet their horses. It's an adventure for young families to spend an afternoon at the Downs. I'm very proud to hide at the track today in this house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to uh, speak about a passionate advocate for improving accessibility in our province, Dr. Linda Campbell, a professor and senior research fellow in environmental science at St. Mary's University, who is a deaf Nova Scotian and a resident of Halifax, Armdale. I wish to uh, thank Dr. Campbell for reaching out to me in January and involving me in meetings being held by Bill 59 Alliance, a group that worked extremely hard over the last several months to put forward meaningful recommendation and strengthen Bill 59. I, w I, uh, I wish to thank Dr. Campbell's and other members of the Alliance whom I was able to hear from personally about the reality and challenges of living with disability in Nova Scotia and ask all members of the House of Assembly to join me in applauding Dr. Campbell and all those who contributed to Bill 59, the Alliance's work, which greatly improved the final piece of legislation. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Mr. Speaker, Dylan Garland is a, an award-winning filmmaker originally from Barrington who has directed more than 30 music videos, numer numerous short films, and worked on several Canadian television series. And Dylan has been awarded two East Coast Music Awards, two Hollywood Music and Media Awards, an IMEA Music Award, a Los Angeles Music Award, a Music Award, Nova, a Music Nova Scotia Award, and won Best Short Film Award at the 2013 Cat Film Festival. And a review of his feature film, called Afraid to Speak, the story of a young man dealing with depression called Dylan, uh, a natural born filmmaker and a major new player on Atlantic Canada's ever-changing cinema scene after it was featured at the 2016 Parsboro Film Festival. I congratulate Dylan Garland for his outstanding work in film and video and for bringing the difficult subject of depression to a wider audience. The Honourable Minister of Education on an introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw everyone's attention to the gallery opposite. Uh, as we know, there have been, there's been a committee of there's been a committee of teachers who have been working very hard um, to put together uh, actions for us to implement. Uh, one of those teachers is here today. We have received the report on the Council to improve classroom conditions. Um, Michael Cosgrove is here. Uh, he's joined us in the gallery. He has been speaking to media. He's getting all kinds of uh, practice. But Michael is a teacher at uh, Dartmouth High, teaches English and philosophy, and has indicated to me that the Council has worked uh, six days, 55 hours. So I think they're to be commended. Thank you very much. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just may, like to make a quick uh, introduction. Uh, uh, in the uh, East Gallery, we have uh, Reverend uh, Jerry Leet uh, with us, who comes by uh, to acknowledge uh, all MLAs and the work they do. And perhaps in the next couple of weeks, he can include us all in his prayers. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to commend the generous and compassionate spirit demonstrated by Truro's Sam's Pizza. On Wednesday evenings, the staff at Sam's takes their wood fire cooked pizzas down to Truro's Homeless Outreach Society to share with our community members experiencing homelessness. Taking pressure off volunteers and giving the Outreach Society a bit of a break from having to plan a menu for that night. They've been doing this for the past three years, Mr. Speaker. This is an exemplary uh, a 
of community spirit in Truro. is a, It's a sample of why I'm so proud to represent this district, and I'd like to, the House to join me in recognizing the work of the entire team at both Sam's Pizza and the Truro Homeless Outreach Society. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, the Council to Improve Classroom Conditions issued their report. You know what? I do think we should all give them a big round of applause and a big thanks for the work that they have done. In fact, Mr. Speaker, that council got more work done in a few weeks than this government got done for education in three and a half years. And you know what? It's true. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, after the way this government treated the teachers of Nova Scotia, it's particularly impressive, the work that they got done. For example, Mr. Speaker, for three years, teachers have been asking for caps on our classrooms, and the Premier said no. He told them we couldn't afford it. He told them it would cost $41 million, Mr. Speaker, and I will table that estimate that the Premier and his government made when he was telling them no. Now, on the even election, the Premier, it only costs 5.9. Does the member have a question? It only costs 5.9. All of a sudden, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask the Premier, was he overestimating the cost of class caps for three years, or is he underestimating it now? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to uh, again thank uh, those teachers who came across the province, from across the province, to work uh, with the department uh, to lay out uh, uh, improvements that we could continue to make in the classroom. I want to remind the leader of the Conservative Party uh, that successive budgets here in this province, we've continued to put class caps. We started from P to three. We went from three to six. Very proud of the work that the, uh, cl the classroom teachers have done over the last uh, couple of weeks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I also want to remind the honourable member, he's the one who said he would disband that council. Uh, we're going to continue, we're, we're, we're going to continue, Mr. Speaker, to invest in classrooms and we're going to continue to invest in teachers, Mr. Speaker, because our kids deserve it. The honourable leader of the official opposition. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we would have had class caps a long time ago if we actually had a Premier and a government that had listened to teachers in the first place. But it took an election to get them to pay attention, Mr. Speaker, and that's a shame because the students and teachers of Nova Scotia, they deserve a government with vision, not just in the last week of their mandate, but with vision all four years, Mr. Speaker. The Premier even went out of his way to tell teachers, you can't afford class caps, it's $41 million. now today by by magic, it's 5.9, Mr. Speaker. How can teachers and parents trust any number this Premier ever presents on education when he makes the numbers up to suit his own political needs? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member. Uh, and, and you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I, I again want to thank those teachers who came in here. And I want to tell each and every one of them that I value and respect what they've been doing in classrooms, Mr. Speaker. And I value the work that they've done with this committee and I respect and I believe in the things that they brought forward to our government. We will continue to work for them. We will continue to make investments in classroom, no matter how negative the honourable member will come. It's one thing to be negative towards us, Mr. Speaker, in this house, but to criticize those teachers who've come in here for 15 times, they were the ones you should stand up and congratulate them. The honourable leader of the official opposition. Well, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we've seen how much this government respects teachers. We've seen how much they respect students. They locked the students out of our classrooms last December. They told teachers they were greedy. They told teachers they were asking for too much. They told teachers they were wrong about classrooms, Mr. Speaker. Teachers know exactly how much that Premier respects them, Mr. Speaker. If he means what he says, then he should stand in his place now, and I will ask him, apologize to the teachers of Nova Scotia for calling them greedy when there was no election, and suddenly giving them the legitimate things they were asking for on the eve of a vote. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to remind the Honourable Member, he may have missed in the number of budgets that we've introduced, that each and every time we've invested in classrooms across the province, Mr. Speaker, we continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. And not a single time, Mr. Speaker, we've been, this is the first question, Mr. Speaker, that we've had on education from the Honourable Member. While teachers have been continuing to work across, continue to improve classrooms, I want to remind Mr. Speaker that I want to thank those teachers who continue to work in here, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank all those Nova Scotians who've worked with our government over the last four years to put ourselves in good fiscal health, 
And each and every time along that journey, we invested in classrooms. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we asked all public servants that we could provide a, a wage increase that we believed was fair at the same time when we were investing in classrooms and health care and other services that Nova Scotians have come to expect and deserve, Mr. Speaker. It is a balanced approach. It's a different approach than the honourable member would bring forward. We're very proud of our record and we're grateful for those teachers who've worked with us. The honourable leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the stories emerging from the health care workers and patients about the state of the emergency rooms in this province is beyond troubling. I ask all MLAs in this House to picture themselves or a loved one shivering on a gurney in a hallway for hours on end with no privacy. Hallway medicine is not a solution to overcrowding our ERs. It has to stop, Mr. Speaker. It has to stop today. So I'd like to ask the Premier, how will this budget end hallway medicine in our hospitals today? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, we continue to, the Minister of Health has continued to work with health care providers, with the Health Authority, to continue to improve uh, infrastructure across the province. We continue to work on a uh, human resource plan uh, to ensure that we have uh, doctors, nurse practitioners, family practice nurses, all health care providers and communities practicing. We know there's more work to do. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member has increased uh, emergency room capacity in Dartmouth General uh, here on the Halifax side uh, of the harbour. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, to make those investments and work with communities uh, because, as the Honourable Member said, Nova Scotians deserve top quality health care. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the Premier, to him, on a continuous theme, it continues to get worse. Mr. Speaker, the Premier continues to talk about strategic investments. While I know we have to make long-term investments, this Premier cannot ignore the short-term needs that are putting the health and safety of workers and patients at risk. He cannot ignore the patients lying in hallways and family rooms. He cannot strip away the dignity in this way while at the same time standing here in this house patting himself on the back. So I'd like to ask the Premier, how can he stand here today and celebrate this budget while our hospitals are resorting to hallway medicine to deal with the overcrowding in our ERs? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, I want to remind him uh, the budget, I believe the Health Department has increased by $75 million this budget. Uh, the last NDP budget, it was $50 million increase, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've continued to invest in, in health care. Uh, we, we continue to make sure uh, that the infrastructure is in place. We're going to continue to make sure that we continue to go out and work with those health care providers. One of the things that has become very clear, Mr. Speaker, that the health care infrastructure was ignored for a very long time, Mr. Speaker, particularly it was ignored under the NDP government that made no investment in improving that, and we're going to continue to make that investment. The Honourable Leader in the House for the New Democratic Party. The third time, uh, Mr. Speaker, I hope the Premier gets a chance to at least try to address this question. Mr. Speaker, I doubt, I doubt those lying hospital hallways or family rooms are celebrating this budget. In fact, I bet they are certainly disappointed, perhaps even angered by the standing ovations that this Liberal government gave himself yesterday. The code census report available to the Premier, the stories emerging from the overcrowding ERs are in the media, and the Premier should read these, Mr. Speaker. How can this government ever fix the problems when they won't even admit there's a problem in the first place? So yeah. I asked the Premier, will he admit today that there is a crisis, I underline the word crisis, in our health care system created by this government with a lack of attention to the front care health givers? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. The challenges in health care, Mr. Mr. Speaker, is the fact that Nova Scotians gave the NDP a chance to govern and they completely ignored the health care infrastructure. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, yesterday. Order, please. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Order, please. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Yesterday, Halifax Mayor Mike Savage said he was surprised by the $7.5 million purchase of the Whopper lands in Bayers Lake. In fact, the Mayor said it was a surprise to all of us, and I will table that for the benefit of the House, Mr. Speaker. We know this land was bought without a proper tender at 12 times its assessed value. It seems odd that the government didn't even talk to HRM about that purchase since they are a significant landholder in the area and they may have been able to swap some land cost free. So I'd like to ask the Premier why didn't his government look to the land holdings of the Halifax Regional Municipality which are already owned by the taxpayer when it decided to buy the Walker lands? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable for the questions. I've said to him uh, a number of times in this House uh, when we looked at the people who were using the facility, 60% of them are outside of of HRM, uh, Mr. Speaker, they would be funneled downtown uh, to the peninsula. It didn't make sense to continue that. This was an opportunity for we are a generation that can uh, shape the healthcare delivery model. When we looked at the 40% of those in HRM are using the facility, Mr. Speaker, many, many of them live out in that uh, catchment area. There were 15 pieces of land property that we looked at. We narrowed it down to negotiate. And Mr. Speaker, the mayor is the mayor of HRM. I'm the premier of Nova Scotia, and this is a healthcare facility for all Nova Scotians. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. Order, please. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's hard, it's hard to ask questions when the Liberal and the NDP members are being so negative. <laughs> That's for those guys. That's for those guys. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Premier seems to know better than the chief city planner, planner for HRM about where this, lo this uh, facility should be located because uh, Chief Planner Bob Bjork says it'll be nearly impossible to provide adequate transit services out there. This is a direct quote. And he added that that area is already congested. But the government went ahead anyway and bought the Whopper Drop lands without tender for 12 times their assessed value, Mr. Speaker. That $7.5 million is coming out of the health care budget. It could be used for doctors. It could be used for facilities. But instead, it's being used to buy land in an area without proper services that's already congested. The only way that this will ever be cleared up is if the government releases all the documents that were involved in this decision. So will the Premier agree, before the end of today, to release all the documents related to the Whopper Drop land purchase? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, staff at Transportation Infrastructure Renewal did an outstanding job, Mr. Speaker, of looking at traffic patterns of people. Uh, they came through, Mr. Speaker, were using that facility. Uh, they looked at 15 different sites, uh, Mr. Speaker, narrowed it down to a few. They went into negotiations with this site. This site will be uh, uh, ready for construction, Mr. Speaker, when it's taken over by the province. Uh, water, sewer, roads will be brought in, Mr. Speaker. Uh, blasting will have taken place. Uh, this is an investment uh, that is in the best interest of all Nova Scotians to continue to deliver health care, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward uh, to the members in that community going out knocking on doors, Mr. Speaker, to hearing from the residents that live in that area who are grateful, Mr. Speaker, that a government is finally listening to them and putting the health care infrastructure where the people live. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What the government delivered to Nova Scotians yesterday was a budget of zeros. While that side of the House was patting itself on the back, the rest of the province was scratching their heads and wondering why the budget didn't include any of the investments the province desperately needs. Wait times for nursing homes in some, area of the in some areas of the province, Mr. Speaker, are over 1,000 days. So I'd like to ask the Premier, uh, how many nursing home beds were created under this new, will be created under this new budget? The, the Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, uh, I will also uh, want to thank the Minister of Health for the continued work he's been doing in reducing the uh, wait list for long-term care facilities. Also, Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank uh, the Nova Scotia Government Employees Union and the Nurses Union, Mr. Speaker, who worked with government to eliminate 
uh, home care wait lists, uh, Mr. Speaker, across the province, continuing to make sure that seniors get to stay home uh, as long as possible, and it's through that level of collaboration and cooperation that we're continuing to provide people with those services. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Zero, uh, Mr. Speaker. There are so many vulnerable Nova Scotians today as we stand here debating and asking questions that are in hospitals throughout the, the province that need long-term care placements, Mr. Speaker. They're waiting months, months, Mr. Speaker. Uh, something else missing in the budget is collaborative emergency centres or the mention of collaborative emergency centres, Mr. Speaker. This year, emergency room closures are up and they've been up ever since this government took office, Mr. Speaker. Emergency rooms in Halifax and in Industrial Cape Breton are bursting at its seams, forcing patients in hallways and makeshift rooms. So I'd like to ask, uh, will the Premier uh, tell me how many new collaborative emergency centres are included in this budget? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll ask the Minister of Health to respond. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. What I'd like to tell the member opposite and the House and all Nova Scotians is that I remember today when there were 350 patients waiting in hospitals for placement. Uh, today we run between 150 and 175 right across the province, many in transitional care. When I delivered my, my first uh, address uh, uh, to the House of Assembly in 2014, we had 2,563 on the wait list for, uh, uh, for nursing homes. Today we're at 1,100 across Nova Scotia for 133. And, and you know... Order, please. Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. And you know, Mr. Speaker, the story gets absolutely better because we offered those on the list proper, proper care at home. And today across Nova Scotia, again, when I first reported, we had over 14,000 unserviced hours. Today we're down to a couple of hundred, just in time, home care service in our province. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, in 2012, the now Premier was very critical and negative about the way that the NDP rigged the electoral boundary process and the boundaries that were drawn as a result of that process. In fact, he said at the time, this whole process has undermined the confidence in many ways of the voter, and I'll table that quote for the benefit of the House. I'd like to ask the Premier today if he knew that the process used by the NDP was wrong in 2012, why is he insisting on using those same boundaries today? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, <coughs> we agreed uh, with the court when they said the former Attorney General, the NDP uh, Attorney General, interfered with the process uh, from an independent commission. <coughs> We've reached out to the complainant who uh, took the complaint to uh, the court and asked them uh, to give us the definition of effective representation, what they believe is effective representation. We told them at that point, and we're reaching out to the African Nova Scotia community for that very answer, so that when we reconstitute a commission, we'll put them out into that community and we'll make sure, Mr. Speaker, that when the new Boundaries Commission goes out and sets the boundaries, uh, that it will be a reflection of what the minority communities have felt was missing in the last one. And Mr. Speaker, when, those, when that commission is struck and those boundaries are set, whatever election comes after that will follow those boundaries. The <coughs> Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Premier just earlier bragged about being the Premier of Nova Scotia. His number one job is to protect the constitutionally enshrined rights and freedoms of Nova Scotians. You don't need, Mr. Speaker, uh, someone else to tell you what effective representation is. It's in the Constitution of Canada, Mr. Speaker, and there have been court cases that have provided that definition. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, the member for Yarmouth has been very negative today. It's hard to ask questions. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'd have to ask the Premier, doesn't he want to know whether the boundaries are constitutional or not before he calls an election? Wouldn't it be reasonable 
to actually find out first, Mr. Speaker. He was against the boundaries in the last election, Mr. Speaker. Now he's ready to turn a blind eye to whether the current boundaries are unconstitutional, Mr. Speaker. In fact, he said at the time he would never compromise on these minority rights, Mr. Does Speaker. Does the member have a question? My question, Mr. Speaker, is pretty direct. Why is the Premier compromising the minority rights of Nova Scotians now when he was against it before the last election? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the court did not say the boundaries are unconstitutional, Mr. Speaker. What the court said was that the Attorney General under the NDP believed he had the same answer as the leader of the Conservative Party just stood up and said, Mr. Speaker. He said he interfered. It was inappropriate. What, what he said was, and what we have said, we're reaching out to the Acadian community, the African Nova Scotia community, and let's have a conversation. Does the, does the Acadian community believe that they're fairly represented by the three protected ridings that existed before? I've heard from people in Shedekant, Mr. Speaker, who say they didn't feel represented represented by those three communities. The largest Acadian community is in HRM. What we're asking for is what does the Acadian community believe is effective representation? The same question we're asking to the African Nova Scotia communities all across Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, from one end to the other. We want them to be engaged in this process so when we reconstitute a new Boundaries Commission, Mr. Speaker, we can give them the instructions that reflect the values of minorities in this province and that when the Boundaries Commission is struck and are laid out, they will feel like they've been heard and represented. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotia has invested more than $900,000 to increase bee numbers, beehive numbers, and that has been successful. There are now more than enough beehives in the province to supply the pollination needs. And in fact, there's uh, the perennia bee line, and I will table that, which shows more than 800 hives available. And if you look at that, most of the major growers are not listed on that. Major beekeepers are not listed on that. In fact, you could easily double, the, double that number, the number of hives available for pollination. Mr. Speaker, the reason for increasing our own beehive numbers was important was to keep pests like the small hive beetle outside, out of Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is, given the more than adequate numbers of beehives in, within Nova Scotia, why would the Minister risk importing small hive beetle from, uh, uh, by permitting 500 hives to come into the province from small hive beetle infested southern Nova the uh, Ontario. Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member raises a very good question. And indeed, we have, uh, according to the information been put out by the bee industry, we have 24,000 pollinators in the province. That's not accurate. We have 20,000. This year we had a 15% death in the beehives. We're down between 17 and 18,000. And that's actual numbers that have been provided by themselves on the census that's done every year. So, and we also implemented the most rigid uh, inspection for the small hive beetle in the world. That is true. And also, and also the, uh, they're also, the, some of the beekeepers are importing bees from Australia, queen bees and clusters that small hive beetle is from and also from California. So this is a very major issue that we, were, we intend to address. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I, my suspicion is the Minister himself wouldn't know a small hive beetle if he saw it, and he's quoting numbers. I would challenge him to table that information. He stated things in the Vanguard, the Yarmouth Vanguard, that he has no support for, and I would, I would suggest to him that the growers, the producers in the industry know the business, and the minister does not know the business. And I would suggest to him that he table where there is small hive beetle in other provinces other than small high, uh, southern Ontario, which he stated in the vanguard, which I will table. The minister also stated in the vanguard, and I quote, when asked why hives wouldn't be imported from a province that doesn't have the pest, he replied that it was not up to the department to decide. It's up to the individuals who will do an importation. Does well, I would suggest have a question? that the minister has an obligation to protect the industry. That's his obligation. Will the minister defend the local beekeepers and the bee industry here and do his job? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Well, as a result of the concerns brought forward by the bee industry, and the research we've done on this, and we have all the facts and figures which we will table later today, or on Monday, uh, we are going to do a complete... We're, 
We're going to do a complete review of the program. When I came to the department, the goal was to double the number of hives in the province to get it to where you don't have to import bees. We're not convinced we're at that point yet. However, we're going to put on hold everything we're doing. We're going to do a complete inventory of all bees in the province of Nova Scotia to see if the numbers are accurate. And, uh, and at that, then we're going to look at the program. Again, when I came to the department, the... I will answer the question, Mr. Speaker, when uh, people are prepared to listen. I'm in no rush. Or order, please. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, with a couple of seconds left. When I first came to the department, the total bee pollination expansion program was $125,000. I increased it to a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's a substantial investment in Nova Scotia's bee industry. <laughs> All right. And now... I'm in no rush. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely no rush. Uh, okay. The, the uh, honourable member for Chester St. Margaret's. Finished. <laughs> they go on and on and on and on with no answer. So, Mr. Speaker, the Premier abandoned negotiations with the federal government to have a health transfer that takes into account Nova Scotia aging population. Instead, he has tried to sell Nova Scotians on a side deal that provides less money overall with a pocket of funding for home care. Well, Mr. Speaker, looking at this budget, it's hard to know what the government plans to do with that money because there are no increases in the budget for home care nursing services or support services. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell us why this money isn't included in the budget lines for the direct care for seniors? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, as you know, uh, we negotiated a health uh, accord with the national government that had a 3% increase uh, across the entire amount of, uh, that would be uh, delivered to the province from the federal government. Uh, we also had dedicated funding, uh, $360 million roughly for, for home care. Uh, again, about another $170 million for adolescent mental health. That funding is a 10-year agreement that will come in. Uh, I also want to remind the Honourable Member of the great work uh, that the Minister of Health has been doing along with uh, our partners with the NSGEU and the NSNU when it comes to home care, uh, to eliminating lists across the province. Uh, we've invested in, in, our, in every budget in, in uh, home care, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Premier for his answer, but the Premier does not have the facts from his minister. The fact is, is that home care supports have a long waiting list. I personally know that. Mr. Speaker, home care seems to be the Premier's answer to everything, but I don't think he tells Nova Scotians the whole truth. We still have seniors waiting for home support services. Like this government's approach to doctors and collaborative care, there's just no plan. Mr. Speaker, what is the Premier's plan for supporting seniors who urgently need home support services? It's the home support services, and maybe the Minister can explain what that is to the Premier. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I want to I want to thank the Minister of Health. Uh, this is a very uh, serious issue. Uh, we know, and uh, people have told us, uh, Mr. Speaker, they want to be, stay home as long as possible. Uh, that's why we've continued to make those investments in home care supports. Uh, I would encourage the Honourable Member to continue to work with the home care delivery agency in her community. Uh, we'll, if the uh, Minister of Health could connect her with the right people. Uh, but I, I, I do want to thank uh, uh, our sister organizations that have worked with us uh, to ensure that we are providing those supports at home. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On December 23rd, the Minister of Finance and the Premier put out a press release that stated the government had reached an agreement with the federal government on health care and that it was a 10-year agreement, and it went on to provide details of that funding. Now, does the Minister still stand behind that release that an agreement was reached and was being implemented with the federal government? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as released in, in December, uh, as uh, people know, uh, there was a finance minister's meeting. Uh, we met uh, with federal, uh, provincial, territorial uh, ministers of finance. Uh, we had uh, health ministers actually join us at that meeting uh, to have discussions about uh, the uh, 
health transfer amounts from the federal government uh, going towards health care. Uh, uh, well, where earlier in that week uh, we failed to come to an agreement, but throughout that week, uh, back in December, Mr. Speaker, uh, we continued our discussions with the federal government, working to get the, the best uh, uh, deal that we could get for Nova Scotia and for Nova Scotians to invest in health care. Mr. Speaker, the budget that I tabled yesterday uh, demonstrates that indeed the transfers from the federal government for health care have increased. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. I, I see Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister avoided answering the question whether he stands by the release, which I guess is the answer. Uh, in a scrum following a more recent Public Accounts Committee meeting, the Minister's deputy was quoted as saying, there was no agreement. And in the meeting he said, in itself, he said, quote, there usually isn't an agreement per se, but there's an understanding. And in the same testimony, he said, talk of an agreement ended earlier in December, before the release came out. So why did the Minister put out a press release announcing an agreement when his deputy says talk about an agreement had already stopped and how can we have faith in any of the minister's statement including his budget since he has claimed there was an agreement that did not exist the honorable minister of finance Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd just like to highlight uh, that uh, an agreement coming to a common understanding, Mr. Speaker, is a, a relatively accepted uh, definition there. Uh, in terms of the agreement that was reached, the, uh, the agreement that was reached, Mr. Speaker, uh, between uh, the federal government with uh, almost all provinces and territories, Mr. Speaker, uh, you can go and look at the press releases, Mr. Speaker, from each and every one of them that came to uh, agreements of the same uh, sort and nature, and the press releases, Mr. Speaker, in each and every case, follow the similar wording and description. Mr. Speaker, we have the same uh, deal with the uh, federal government uh, for those transfers. We've seen increases uh, from the federal government, particularly targeted uh, investments in, in uh, home care and mental health, Mr. Speaker. These are the shared priorities that the provincial government has with our federal partners. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Education. Recent FOIPOP documents shed light on the way this Liberal government decides which communities get new schools. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. There's a vetting process which ranks schools by need. However, Cabinet makes the final decision. And it appears that political need is a major component to that decision-making process. My question, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister explain why five of the schools that jumped the queue were located in Liberal constituencies? The Honourable Minister of Education. <laughs> Thank you. You could be. <laughs> Thank you. Uh Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member for the question, a uh, question that has been answered many times. There are a number of, number of factors that are considered when uh, new school constructions are uh, planned, and uh, the uh, first priority is the program uh, for students. The next priority is for, stu uh, for boards to submit uh, to the department their list of capital requests and that is asked for, uh, considered. We also look at uh, the capacity within the capital budget of the province. We also look at the regional fairness. All of those factors come together and it, has, it is not political. I can tell you when we... When we were elected in 2013, we accepted all of the uh, um, uh, announcements that had been made by the previous government, and uh, we moved forward with those. Those were not, some of those were not in liberal held ridings. We did not consider that. We considered the communities that had been promised those schools, and we followed through on them. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Mr. Speaker, when asked to explain how schools in her own riding and in the Premier's riding got approved over others that were ranked higher, the Minister has said that geography plays a role in that decision making. Sure. My question to the Minister, can the Minister explain how a school in Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg, that is ranked under number 12, was passed over in a school in Dartmouth North that ranked number 41 was chosen? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think it's more important, Mr. Speaker, to talk about uh, the situation in Spring Hill. The town of Spring Hill has requested ANA 
for our new school for two elementaries, all governments, PC, NDP and Liberal have said no, we will not build a new school, we will do a renovation. But you know, Mr. Speaker, not once has the member from that area ever written to me, ever talked to me, ever asked me, ever spoke to me, ever spoke to me on behalf of the good people of Spring Hill about the needs in his community. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, last year I tabled a bill to have mental health court available throughout the province. At the time, the Minister stated a bill was not required, she could do this with exist within existing legislation. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is, that, is this. If that is the case, why has this not happened yet, given the great need for mental health court throughout the province? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member opposite. He and I had a chance to uh, tour the, the um, Central Correctional Facility uh, not very long ago, and we've had discussions about mental health in Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, an extension of various courts in our province, uh, wellness courts is what I'm thinking of, and, and they encompass uh, mental health and, and addictions, and they really are led by our judiciary each time one is, is undertaken and it's because we have a, a judge, a provincial court judge, sitting in some corner of the province who's agreed that it's a priority and has, has worked to change the, the opportunity for a different sort of, of court in their area. The most recent, Mr. Speaker, is an announcement that Wagmacook will have a GLADU, which is a cultural court as well as a wellness court, and it is the result of the, the judge sitting in Port Hawkesbury who's, who has, has spearheaded that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank the minister for that answer. Mr. Speaker, in Kentville, the health authority and courts work together to realign existing services and staff to provide mental health court for very little extra cost. Could that not this model be used throughout the province? That's my question for the minister. Has she looked into the Kentville model, and can it be not be spread throughout the province? The honourable minister of justice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and I agree that, that where the communities have come together with, with the cooperation or leadership from the judiciary, it has been possible. Uh, the mental health court in, in Dartmouth, which is our one that's actually named a mental health court, has actually been very uh, fairly expensive to do with the, the way it's structured, but it's having tremendously positive results, and I know it's a real advantage to so many people who have mental health and who should not really be seen in the regular court system. It requires more sensitivity. So I appreciate the, the comment, the, the suggestion from the member that more of these courts could be done with the uh, communities coming together and putting their resources on the table. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, thousands of Nova Scotians don't make enough money to meet their basic needs. They go without food or medication or heat because their pockets are empty. In yesterday's budget address, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance said putting money into the pockets of Nova Scotians who need it was his government's top priority. Mr. Speaker, since the Minister of Finance has said repeatedly that giving people more money to spend is good economic policy, I'd like to ask the Minister of Community Services why there is no increase to income assistance rates in this budget. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. <clears throat> Thank you, and I thank the member for the question. I have stood in this house for three and a half years and talked about transformation. I have not talked about two or four dollar incremental increases. I have not talked about tinkering. What I have talked about is innovative social policy change that will make a difference in the lives of people who need it the most. Mr. Speaker, yesterday's budget introduced a standardized household rate. Innovation, bold, a leader in this country so that people on income assistance will have a substantial increase and they will be able to keep more of their income when they work. That makes a difference in social policy, Mr. Speaker. That makes a difference. The
Mr. Speaker, many income assistance recipients have been working as long as the Minister and with members of her department for years already on that transformation process. I would like to know when are they going to see the change in their checks so that they can actually have a dignified life in this province. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, we have been working with over 1,800 stakeholders over the last three and a half years, while that government, who are the supposed beacons of social policy in Nova Scotia, gave people two and four dollar increments without changing, without changing the system that keeps people in poverty, which keeps people in poverty. We have made a difference, and we'll continue to make a difference in the province. Mr. Speaker, I was on this system in the 1990s and it was the same system that we came into that that government blew up waiting lists on, hope, on, on affordable housing so we can thank our lucky stars that that party is not responsible for social policy in the province of Nova Scotia. Honourable Member for Inverness. Speaker, a question for the Minister of Health. April Order, is, uh, please. Yeah. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, a question for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, in 2013, here in Halifax, the Canadian Pediatric Society met and they made a recommendation to governments across the country. They asked that governments ensure that children are afforded equal access to basic treatment and preventative oral care, regardless of where they live or their socioeconomic status. In 2015, the Oral Health Advisor Group, however, they recommended to the minister that this government eliminate the universal uh, coverage of universal plan and replace it with a needs-based plan. So my question is to the minister. Will the minister confirm that he will protect our universally accessible children's dental plan? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what, I, what I can say to the member opposite uh, is absolutely uh, we will protect uh, the uh, children's plan. In fact, uh, we need a more uh, robust plan. Uh, the, uh, the previous government went in the wrong direction as the Dental Association of Nova Scotia gave us very specific directions. Uh, spreading it over 14, 15, 16 years was not the way to go, but to do the most work in the early years, and that plan is getting very close to its final delivery. The Honourable Member for Inverness. I'd like to thank the Minister for that, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I think that is, that is one of the points. It's not just universal care, but it's actually getting children into the dentist's chair. And uh, we can see, Mr. Speaker, that uh, I think out of about 150,000 children who are eligible in this province, only 50,000 are finding their way into the dentist's chair. And it's not because of, uh, it's not because of money, uh, Mr. Speaker, because it's universal care. Um, Mr. Speaker, we need a, a care that is proactive. Um, we could be preventing more diabetes, we could be preventing chronic disease uh, versus having children in emergency rooms, uh, getting dental care, having to be put under anesthetic because emergencies have arisen, arisen because this, this preventative care wasn't done. So I'm, I'm hoping to hear, and the Minister has provided a fairly positive response there. My final question, Mr. Speaker, is uh, will the Minister acknowledge, and I think he has, and, and perhaps he can tell us about how we can get more children into the dentist chairs. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, and the member uh, for Inverness uh, uh, raises uh, an extremely uh, valid, uh, well-researched uh, uh, perspective uh, here in the legislature this morning. Uh, when we came to office, we had to work at that end of the spectrum uh, where we needed to increase uh, uh, surgical work at the IWK and had to hire additional pediatric uh, dental uh, uh, special surgeons because of a lack of work in the early years. We're retrenching, we're going to direct uh, more towards those uh, early years uh, and prevent uh, the serious and significant surgeries uh, that have been required uh, in adolescent years and uh, we hope to have uh, that plan in front of uh, Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This could be perhaps um, 
the last opportunity that I have to stand in this place and have the privilege to ask a question to the Minister of Health. And my question is about a young couple that lost their home in Fort McMurray in their 30s, both teachers, decided to move back to Nova Scotia and uh, they are considering moving back out west this fall. They were able to find teaching jobs, which is great. They're not able to find a doctor. They need a doctor, as does many hundreds of people in Picto West alone. Can the minister please tell us if we will have a doctor in Picto West before September? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, I was uh, pleased to be part of the announcement at the uh, Westville uh, Clinic uh, just a week ago, uh, where we added uh, an outstanding uh, nurse to the uh, to the team, uh, to the collaborative practice uh, in Westville, and what we'll. And what we'll be able to do there uh, is add uh, anywhere from 500 to 800 uh, who are actually on the uh, list as, that is now compiled. Uh, the doctors there very specifically said uh, that's the list that they will go to uh, to pick off uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, people of Pictou County, Westville area first, but Pictou County uh, generally uh, so that uh, more can get primary care. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I spoke to that collaborative care the other day. They're not taking anyone, so let's just be clear on that. They've told everyone. They're not taking any more. The other part of this story is actually rather sad. This young couple were in the process of adopting, adopting in Alberta. They need a doctor. I was able to get the adoption agency to waive the part on the application where they don't have to have a full-time doctor. However, each of them needs a physical before the adoption process can go through. Will the minister please leave a legacy and help me get a physical for this young couple so that they can live their dream and grow their family and hang their hat in Nova Scotia, please. This may be his last opportunity too to help. My last opportunity may be your last opportunity. Please, let's work together, get them a physical. Promise me that, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as the member uh, opposite uh, and many here in the House know, uh, that uh, I not only look after uh, the global picture, or work to look after the global picture of Nova Scotia, I've also helped with uh, many individual cases uh, that have uh, come my way, and uh, I will certainly do my best in this particular case that have been raised here this morning. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Premier. Yesterday he talked about working with the film industry as if he's a regular patron of the arts or something. Now, this is the same Premier who thought that the film industry was getting a free ride, Mr. Speaker. A Premier who didn't understand the financial return to the province from investing in the industry, who thought they weren't paying taxes. So I'd just like to ask the Premier, as he tops up the film and television incentive fund on the eve of an election, can he please please at least apologize today to the many film industry workers who had to pack up and move away, some taking their families with them because of his government's callous, short-sighted and mean-spirited actions. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank all those in the film industry, Mr. Speaker, who continued to work with our government over the last year to continue to provide employment to Nova Scotia for many uh, Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the, uh, the film fund she's talking about has a subsidy of 25%, but it is spread beyond just labour. She would know prior to that it was 50 to 65%. We said that was too high. We went down and said we could provide a subsidy that was real for Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. We've continued to make that investment. We'll continue to make that investment and work with them, Mr. Speaker. What's, in what's interesting, Mr. Speaker, is that the honourable member continues to stand in this house and complain and complain and complain. But you know what? The industry, Mr. Speaker, came and worked with us, and that's why they're working in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Mr. Speaker, the, the film industry came and tried to work with this government because their hands were tied behind their backs, and they knew that they, if they didn't come and work with them, they had nothing, Mr. Speaker. Nothing. 
So, Mr. Speaker, some extra money from the, for the incentive fund will help some offshore service pr producers become viable again. However, companies wanting to grow our local, independent film industry have been seriously crippled by a lack of equity investment by this government and by the cutting of the Film and Television Development Fund, which have both helped to make, create a local industry. So my question for the Premier is, why is his government opposed to equity investment in the film industry that would help local producers tell our local stories right here in Nova Scotia instead of having to go off somewhere else where they can get it? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If the Honourable Member would stop complaining so much, you would actually listen and realize there are many people working in the province of Nova Scotia. We've continued to invest in the film industry, Mr. Speaker, and the investment we're making is spread beyond, Mr. Speaker, just labour in those uh, in the film industry, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's spread across many sectors. We're seeing it based in the economy. We're seeing that grow in the economy. And I want to thank Screen Nova Scotia for continuing to work with us, to continue to try to provide an opportunity for many young Nova Scotians to be here. And I'm grateful for the fact, Mr. Speaker, they didn't accept the negativity of the Honourable Member and that party. They actually came to work with our government to provide opportunity. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, I, with great reluctance, need to correct a statement made by the Minister of Education during question period. As member for Cumberland South, I'm very proud of the fact that I have raised the Spring Hill School order, both please. in this house. This, this so is, not a, the, is it a point of order or a disagreement of facts? Presenting a point of order, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you'll, you'll get this very quickly. I don't want to take up a lot of time, uh, both in this House in question period and in the examination of the estimates. The Minister raises the issue of letters in this House. One would think that the annual letter that she gets from the Chignecto Central School Board, which constantly presents their top priority for new construction as a new school for Spring Hill would be enough, but given her answer today, Mr. Speaker, it's been very clear that politics actually do play a role in new school construction instead of the priorities of the school board. That's not a point of order, that's a disagreement of facts. The Honourable Government House Leader, Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that we recess uh, to so all members can attend the day of mourning, which is being held downstairs at 11 a.m. Uh, I suggest that we return at uh, the conclusion of the ceremony or 12.15, whichever is later. The motion is to recess. Is it agreed? It is agreed. The House will now stand recessed until the conclusion of the day of mourning ceremony or 12.15, whichever comes first. Last.
Order, please. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, on uh, Tuesday, uh, we were asked by the Government House Leader uh, to uh, consent to uh, moving Bill 59 onto the order paper and have it debated because it was an important bill. And I'd be remiss if uh, on the day of uh, International or the Morning, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, to ask for that similar consent for a bill that the uh, government introduced today, Bill 90, which would do what we think Nova Scotia would want us to improve uh, workplace safety. So I would ask uh, for consent of the House to move that Bill 90 uh, be placed on the order paper today and called for second reading for debate. Is it agreed? I hear several no's. The Honourable Gov Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, please call uh, government motions. We'll now call government motions. Please call Resolution 915. We'll call Resolution 915. The Honourable Member for Picto East with three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker. Just wanted to uh, to conclude on my final words on this on this bill with a, a few with a few comments on what happens to ordinary Nova Scotians when government doesn't dot its I's and cross its T's. And I think a number of the issues that have been heavily discussed in this House have to do with the fact that the, the government really hasn't done its homework, that the government hasn't followed process. And if you think of the land deal, we wouldn't be talking about this land deal if it would have been tendered, if government would have fallen, fallen process. But instead, here we have people raising questions about the developer, about, about the price, all these issues that are only coming up because the government didn't follow a proper process. And it's a shame when government makes decisions that drag ordinary Nova Scotians into issues in this legislature. We've seen it time and time again with this government. If you think about the issue with the school boards and the new schools, there was a process to be followed. And the government uh, makes um, school board members, the, good, the fine people of school board members, deliver bad news, close schools, that's the old thing. And then the, 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 when there's a camera to be taken and, and smiles to be had, they open schools. So there's been a lot of discussion about what, where the, these schools that have been announced should be made or not. And it, what a shame to those communities to have that question. But nobody's questions whether those communities need a school or not. They're only questioning the actions of this government because when government doesn't do its homework, it can make good, upstanding people look bad. And that's what we've seen with that. And now we have the same thing happened with the, for the Lunenburg Ship Builders Alliance, the $5 million payment. The government didn't do its homework to support it. So instead, people ask questions about it. So government takes actions that cause people to question why the government has taken those actions. And it's a complete shame. And I would, I would like to finish off uh, with the bees. The bees are a serious, serious issue. And I'm sure, um, I'm sure the uh, company that's importing one truckload of bees doesn't want to put the entire industry at risk. But it's the, it's the path government has set us on by not doing its homework. So the only thing is I would, I would leave, I, I would close with my words on this, Mr. Speaker, is I would urge uh, the, the next government that sits in this House and uh, successive governments to treat process with respect, to do their homework beforehand. We had a number of bills in this session over the last four years pulled back, government bills pulled back because the homework wasn't done. Please, please, you owe it to Nova Scotians as a government to do your homework, dot your I's, cross your T's beforehand. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, certainly an honour to uh, have the opportunity to uh, address and reply to this year's budget. And Mr. Speaker, here we are again on the eve of election with this government telling us about all the wonderful things that they are doing. Uh, but how... You may ask the question, how did we get here, Mr. Speaker? And yesterday, uh, the opposition member from Pigtoe East, and just a few minutes today, 
I, I, my uh, observation did a fair job. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be a bit generous, uh, gen uh, generous and I actually uh, made this comment yesterday, but I'm going to give the member from Pig 2 East, especially on his last comments here, I'm going to give him a B plus for his budget address. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2013, the, cam the campaigning Liberals leader promised to put Nova Scotians first. Instead, the Premier has spent three and a half years of trying to cut his way to prosperity, while at the same time helping his Liberal friends. The Premier set out the tone right after coming into office by handing a $85,000 job to a failed Liberal candidate. Pure patronage, Mr. Speaker. They came, then came the amalgamation of the health authorities, was going to transform the system. However, as we have seen, the creation of this super board has resulted in no savings, none whatsoever. In fact, my observation is a cost of a $15 million to that. Furthermore, while this government has been busy rearranging bureaucrats, the health care system in this province has been rapidly declining. 106,000 people without a family doctor, Mr. Speaker. ER closures at an all-time high. Hospitals resorting to hallway medicine. That's not good enough, Mr. Speaker. That's not good enough. Mr. Speaker, then came the cuts. They axed the film tax credit, devastated an industry that has been built up over decades with one swoop of the pen. We watched as film workers circled this house in protest under this government's watch. We witnessed as the police pleasant grew and more tinted SUVs, wagons circled and sat in the parking lot and petty cuts, Mr. Speaker, to community groups that provided minimum savings to the government but had a major negative impact on those community groups. And all the while, the Premier found money to help his Liberal friends. He allowed his top servants, civil servants, to set up a company to avoid paying taxes. How is that putting Nova Scotia's first, Mr. Speaker? But, Mr. Speaker, the government was saving money in other ways by making cuts to long-term care, impacting patients and staff in nursing homes. Not a single, not a single new long-term care bid under this liberal watch, and the number is easy to remember, zero. Meals, food costs for long-term care residents reduced to less than $5 per day. It saved money by underspending the hospital infrastructure, underspending in a tone of $82 million. Meanwhile, it has not opened a single CEC zero, Mr. Speaker. That number is going to be frequent here in this speech, zero. It has also opened a, not opened a single long-term bid. Again, zero. And while these cuts and underspending were taking toll on our, on our patients and health care workers across the province, the Liberal insiders were still laughing all the way to the bank. In January 2015, the Premier appointed, and I repeat appointed, a former Liberal Cabinet Minister to head the Nova Scotia Business Incorporation, a position that pays $210,000 a year. Oh, Mr. Speaker, to be a liberal insider, Mr. Speaker, maybe that's what's called sunny ways. Meanwhile, the Premier promised a doctor, and I remember that very clearly, a doctor for every Nova Scotian was not well and not doing well. I hope the government was not surprised by the fact that this decision to withhold billing numbers and their failure to recruit doctors actually resulted in more people without a family doctor and when this Liberal government came to office. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Premier 
was also on rocky grounds with the public sector workers, Mr. Speaker. Workers he promised to treat fairly. In fact, he wrote an open letter to workers promising to respect the collective bargaining process. And I certainly will add in a few minutes a pile of broken promises, Mr. Speaker. But I distinctly recall that open letter uh, in the election of 2013. Now, while there was no money for public sectors, there was money for a few more staff in the Premier's office. One even got to write her own job description, Mr. Speaker. Oh, to be a Liberal insider. Again, is that the Liberals what called sunny ways? And so we are here today, Mr. Speaker. We're here today. And just to remind you again of the letter's promise of 2013. And the Nova Scotia Liberal Caucus believed in what the letter stated at that time, the collective bargaining process, the right to strike, protecting workers' rights, the letter went on to say, both unionized and non-unionized, and then along came Bill 148 and Bill 75. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, I have made a, a very good case of a broken promise, Mr. Speaker. And the, uh, the list goes on. Mr. Speaker, let's review the past three and a half years under this Liberals' reign. More than 10,000 full-time jobs lost. 5,000 fewer people under 24 in the workplace. The second worst economy in Canada, 2017. Emergency room closures have increased by more than 30%. The longest wait times for hip and knee replacements and surgeries in Canada. Wait times for the mental health care services worry, have increased more days, than 25%. The Nova Scotia, do Nova Scotia has a doctor shortage, and I repeat the number, Mr. Speaker, for those who are jotting down notes here. People in Nova Scotia who do not have a doctor or a family doctor is now risen to 106,000 people across this province. The second highest tuition cost in Canada, and some schools have increased by over 30%. The first public school teacher strike in Get this, Mr. Speaker, 122 years. We all remember Bill 75 just a few weeks ago when there was the largest crowd of my term here of 11 years encircled this building. We all remember that. And Edo Province nurses had to be flown in because of nurses shortage. Is any of this being noted, Mr. Speaker? And I'm sure the public is a uh, making their notes as we uh, are on the eve of election. And this government cut funding to nursing home, Mr. Speaker. Eight million dollars. Eight million dollars. Long-term care, not one new bid in three and a half years. They placed a moratorium on long-term care bids, Mr. Speaker, and the budget for seniors and long-term cares equals less than six dollars per day per meal. The, for the most vulnerable people in our society. Yet Danny Graham, yet Danny Graham is paid over $13,000 per month at Engage Nova Scotia. That, to me, is liberals looking after liberals. Again, is that sunny ways? To me, that probably would fit the bill. It's sunny ways. No, Mr. Speaker, I know that members of the office are listening intently and making notes. And just to refresh their mind, they eliminated the film tax credit. And remember, Mr. Speaker, the PharmaCare fiasco? We all remember that? And they talked about doubling the fees to $2,400. I remember that, Mr. Speaker. The Premier has been absent 30% of the times in Cabinet meetings in the last 2016. 
and we heard it on this floor. It was recommended that cardboard cutouts may replace in Ottawa and maybe a possible good scenario to have here because we could probably get more answers from the, uh, from the cardboard cutout. Mr. Speaker, I'm just getting into it and I, I know that I've got the attention of the government here, so I know they're taking notes intently. So here's an interesting one here, a statistic, Mr. Speaker. And I'll say this slow so I know that the members opposite are carefully writing this down. Really slow, really. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Health had 41 months in government and promised a doctor for every Nova Scotian. Now, now he wants to, for us to believe that he will happen and have a doctor in the next 36 months. Just a little play on numbers there, Mr. Speaker. And I, I didn't bring up that the member from Claire Digby suggested a 10-year term until they meet that goal. Order, please. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne has the floor. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I, I really appreciate your attention to, uh, to the day's uh, activities and, and your wisdom. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals were, were going to lower power rates. Remember that promise? And break the monopoly. Break the monopoly. I remember that in the literature, the campaign. I wonder how that is doing. Well, how it's doing, the monopoly is stronger than ever. Another broken promise. And they were going to fix education in respect to Clark, uh, collective bargaining. The bargaining works. And just an update on both the bills, Mr. Speaker, just an update. And it's my observation, and again, Bill 75, during this session, both opposition members. Quarter, please. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne has the floor. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I enjoy your intervention and your, your wisdom on this because I want these individuals across to take thorough notes. And on Bill 75, they were talking about, in their election campaign in 2013, about protecting workers' rights and bargaining for workers. And in this session, I observed, in my political ability, I observed both opposition parties table bills to repeal Bill 75. And if not, and I know that the Nova Scotia Teachers Union is committed to take that to the Supreme Court of Canada. And just a side note, during Bill 75, Mr. Speaker, there was discussion here, and I believe I raised the point, a similar bill was introduced uh, compared to Bill 75, and that was out in BC. It took 14 years to go through the court system. It spent 20 minutes in the Supreme Court. Now, 20 minutes, I, I told this story before. I cannot drink a cup of coffee in 20 minutes. The Supreme Court decision on the BC decision, all he'd simply done was read the Charter of Rights. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? Bill 75 will not only be repealed, and if it's not successful, it's not going to get too far when it gets to the courts. Mr. Speaker, we've had a government here that promised to fix the roads. And the very first day is interesting. Transportation infrastructure renewal, the very first day, three and a half years ago, they sold the paving equipment. And what we see now over three and a half years is paving less and costing more. And now they have the courage to talk about a program of improving our road system by investing $390 million, but wait, here's the catch, Mr. Speaker. You're going to have to spread that over the next seven years. Well, I did the math, and just out of curiosity, they possibly could be two more elections, possibly three elections over the next seven years. So I just want to follow that one with great interest, and we'll see how many roads are completed with this particular uh, program. 
And this particular government, Mr. Speaker, boasts about stopping corporate handouts. $22 million to the Bank of Montreal in offshore banks. I think that's a broken promise, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just working my way slowly through this list, Mr. Speaker. And I ask the members over there to take careful notes because there is going to be some homework for this weekend. And if you take notice, in my last several speeches, I've always had some homework for the sitting government and the backbenchers. So there's going to be a test at the end of this speech. Mr. Speaker, long-term care, as I mentioned earlier, there was a moratorium that was put on building nursing homes. And it's ironic that this Liberal government boasted, they boasted in 2013 of keeping the previous government's commitment of long-term care. And one of those long-term care facilities in Middlefield, just outside of Liverpool, is still waiting. And I think they'll be going to be waiting for a while until there's a government change to get that home built. Not one, not one long-term care under this particular government. And interesting enough, the previous four years, which I had the fortune of spending some time in, in government, there was over a thousand bids created. And I suggest to you here today, Mr. Speaker, and those who are listening intently, that by them 1,000 bids that were created in that four-year time frame, that they freed up hospital bids. And they relieved the pressure on these institutions that we are seeing that's overcrowded as I speak. And I'll get to that a little later on in the speech. And Mr. Speaker, the promises the Premier said that, uh, again, a doctor for everybody in 2013. And it's interesting that the health minister, if I can back up here, came to the town of Shelburne and promised to keep our ERs open. That was somewhere around two years ago, a year and a half ago. But I know that the members on this side can clearly recall myself standing in this seat identifying each closure at Roseway Hospital. Everyone in one session. That was after the Minister of Health came to Shelburne and said, we have a plan. We are going to address the closures in the ERs, not only in Roseway, but right across our beautiful province, Mr. Speaker. And you know what the story, the end of this story is? It got worse. It got worse, the highest record in Canada. And then, just to add to that story, the previous session, we had the member from Claire Digby stand in his seat, address this congregation here, the delegation of MLAs, and suggested, Mr. Speaker, well, maybe we're not going to meet that goal, and we're going to kick that, probably the goalpost, down the road a bit. Ten years down the road, Mr. Speaker. That's not a promise that I think is going to address the issue. And I can assure you that I truly believe that health care is the major issue across our Atlantic provinces. And a few weeks ago, we had the Minister of Health suggest that, well, it's not 10 years, it's going to be three years that we can provide that service. So, Mr. Speaker, we're left with a challenge. We're left with a challenge, and this is it. You pick a number, Mr. Speaker. Is it 10 years? Is it three years? Is it one for every doctor this year? It's going to be interesting to see what the Liberal platform is as they enter this election regarding health care. And, Mr. Speaker, I have designed three words to describe the situation that they're in, because they can't pick a number, and the three words to describe their health care platform is, don't get sick. Now, I think that's going to have a lot more uh, trust in the population than if you back up three and a half years ago, Mr. Speaker, and they suggested that we'll have a doctor for everyone. Now, Mr. Speaker, overcrowding in our hospital 
And this is something that's certainly of interest to me, and I think that the, we have seen this system uh, deteriorate over the last few years. Now, Mr. Speaker, early in uh, the last two days, we have seen the overcrowding, certainly mentioned in uh, QP, and the beginning of a new term in our medical care vocabulary, and it's certainly a new phrase for myself in this, in this particular uh, setting, it's called hallway medicine. Now, what we've heard is that there's 118 doctors vacancies, and like I repeated earlier, 106 people, 106,000 people without a family doctor. We have overcrowding or closed emergency e ER rooms, and the wait times are two or three years for surgery. And interesting enough, Mr. Speaker, I've heard several times during question period, this Premier stand in his place and say very clearly that there is no crisis. And I repeat, no crisis. And to me, I know that we have different political approaches, and I accept that. But, Mr. Speaker, I, I actually Googled the word crisis because I wanted to understand the meaning of that thoroughly because we were using it, certainly I have used it, to describe the situation that we are entering into. And the Google Dictionary gives us this terminology. It is a time of intense difficulty. It is trouble or danger. But if you read on, probably the best me meaning is, it's a time when a difficult, important decision must be made. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know that there's a difference of opinion of the Premier says there's no crisis, but what I hope to conclude in my closing remarks here in the next few minutes is that there is a crisis in our health care system. And I hope that my members uh, opposite are taking thorough notes uh, because there will be a test, Mr. Speaker. Certainly, to me, this is certainly a, the main uh, thrust of my speech, Mr. Speaker, and the address certainly to this budget, and to all the witnesses certainly, or the MLAs in this chamber, Mr. Mr. Speaker. This Premier stated that there is no crisis, that we have, we have a hospital um, infrastructure underspent in the last three years by $82 million. We have hospitals floors closing for months to be fixed leaky roofs. And if I can make a sample in Lunenburg or in Yarmouth of hospitals floors being closed because of a leaky roof and uh, people are losing MRI services. And to me, this, this is something that, that has a ripple effect that goes the whole way through the system. And uh, the MRI's appointments is something that I know that is important to those individuals. And yet we see the infrastructure money being severed and not spent over the last three years. And yet we can show clearly examples where the roof is leaking. And there's, there has to be infrastructure and we've had appointments canceled and it just escalates the, the problem. Mr. Speaker, I mentioned that we have 106,000 Nova Scotians without a family doctor. ERs are closing at a record high, and the wait times is the highest in Canada. No and what is interesting, in just this new cha in this chamber here a few few days ago, the Nova Scotia, it was testimony here that uh, Nova Scotia needs to recruit 100 doctors a year for the next decade says Dr. Nova Scotia. To me, Mr. Speaker, that is certainly an interesting comment because to me there is a warning sign that uh, the iceberg of our aging population is certainly coming at us and we are not properly prepared. When Dr. Nova Scotia gives you that warning, I would think that uh, I would lean towards the 
the seriousness that we are in a crisis. Mr. Speaker, just a few days ago, the, in this chamber, Nancy McCreary Williams, CEO of Doctors Nova Scotia, told this very legislature and the Public Accounts the Committee that there were 118 doctors' vacancies throughout this province. As well, that there was 1,300 of the 2,400 physicians currently practicing are over the age of 50, and 300, excuse me, 630 are over 60, suggesting that there's a shortage will become more acute as doctors wrap up their careers. And I'll just quote Ms. Williams, and I quote, the last two years, it's been more pronounced than we've seen in previous years, she said after speaking to the committee. Now, Mr. Speaker, I would take that as a warning sign. And after the information that we've heard from uh, the opposition, including myself, and the Premier, on one side of we have a crisis or we don't have a crisis. And I know this is what this chamber is for, is to put the information forward and hopefully that we can decide on what the outcome. But I think I'm winning this argument, Mr. Speaker, as I speak. Mr. Speaker, it sounds like a crisis to me. Today, in my hometown, this is an interesting story, Mr. Speaker, and I, I hope that the members of the office will pay, pay attention. Today, in my hometown, when a new doctor starts, he or she usually starts with half the workload of the former doctor. Now, the former doctor, Mr. Speaker, may have three to 4,000 patients. Now, and I, all, I appreciate the new doctors coming, and I understand that they have to work their way up to the workload of the former doctors. I'm not disagreeing with it. But what I'm disagreeing with is that if the new doctor wants to add new patients, there is a phone lottery. There is a phone lottery for the first for the first 50 or 100 patients who calls in. Is this what our universal health care has come to? A phone lottery? I think it's in a crisis, Mr. Speaker. And that little story there is really, really evidence of how the evolution of our universal health care has come to roll Nova Scotia, and if you're not successful, and if you're not had the doctor on speed dial, you are out of luck. Well, I would suggest with that story that I would weigh on the side of our health care is in a crisis, Mr. Speaker. You don't have to, or you should not have to, win a lottery. To me, Mr. Speaker, it sounds like a crisis to me, Mr. Speaker. And I want to talk about hallway medicine, because I know that certainly is a new terminology in this setting. Mr. Speaker, CBC News on March the 27th, 2017, it was titled, Patients at Nova Scotia Largest Hospital Not Safe, says the union. Overcrowding has become routine at the hospital infirmary, infirmary emergency rooms department, says the Nova Scotia General Employees Union President. The union that represent nurses and other health care workers at the province's largest hospital compact has concluded patients are receiving care that is not safe. Not safe, Mr. Speaker. For the largest unions represent nurses, Mr. Speaker, that sounds like a crisis to me. Now, again, I know that the members of the government has taken thorough notes, and I want you to compare the notes over the weekend to what the Premier says, that there's no crisis here, and what the opposition is saying, including myself. Mr. Speaker, the conclusion comes that follows a review of the statistics obtained from the Nova Scotia Health Authority that shows how often emergency room physicians or charged nurses at the Halifax Infirmary declared a code census. A code census happens when the emergency department 
is overcrowded as it seems to be unsafe. The staff and other departments now have 30 minutes, 30 minutes to prepare to accept more patients in order to free up beds in emergency. Last year, there was 146 code census at the Halifax Infirmary Emergency Department, up from 110 in 2015 and 42 in 2014. There have been 39 already in January and February of this year. Mr. Speaker, that sounds like a crisis to me, and it's growing, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's interesting that we observe this province by seven, spent $7.5 million on layers on land outside of Bears Lake to build a, build a new health center. And I guess the question I ask, has that been thoroughly gone through the tendering process? The answer is no. Is this Liberal government looking, simply looking after Liberal friends? It probably would fit in that category. And we know the developer certainly had donated $3,000 to the Nova Scotia Liberal Party in 2000. In 13. Again, is this sunny ways? Is this simply liberals looking after liberals? And Mr. Speaker, the developers sold only 15 acres to the liberals of the 177 acres parcel of land that he owned and got most of his money back, plus still has roughly 162 acres left. That's good fiscal management. Now, good fiscal management, I wonder if we can get the developer in here in one province house and probably help out the Premier. And to me, it certainly sounds like Liberals looking after Liberals on the eve of election. Mr. Speaker, getting back to the hallway medicine, and I know and uh, we should be, uh, is something that I have learned that term here in the last few months in the hallway medicine, and I noticed some media outlets have uh, entertained a story about uh, the first patient or the patient on the, patient on the gurney uh, participating in the hallway medicine. And I, can, I really sympathize with those individuals that have to endure a situation like that. And I truly believe that the word crisis is the right word to describe a situation like that. And I want to paint this scenario. And I know that certainly when we have our family members enter near-death experiences, and we all go through this, and a hallway, Mr. Speaker, is not a place to have a privacy or a family uh, in them surroundings when people are in those dire situations. And I truly believe that that's inexcusable. And we have a university health system and Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly the government has failed by creating this shortage of doctors, not having access to long-term care facilities, is certainly backing up more people in these ER emergencies. We have 106,000 people without a family doctor. We have communities that do not have access to kidney dialysis machine, unless, Mr. Speaker, you are a liberal. Again, that certainly doesn't fall into what I believe as universal health care. So when you have hallway patients, and to me, as the next session, are we going to see more of these uh, scenarios? And I simply believe that that's unacceptable for when people are, are entering the last stages of life that possibly could be in a sitting like that. And not only for that individual who are, is at the end of life, but also for the family members, Mr. Speaker. And there's an interesting story that just evolved to me, and I know that my, my family, or one of my members of my family, will be entering the, that scenario, uh, the, the hospital scenario, in the next few months. And an interesting side note saying that the doctors are telling the individual now that you need a loved one 
to accompany you during the first couple days of surgery. Now, I want to separate the two between the end-of-life scenario and some serious surgery. Now, Mr. Speaker, if you are one of those patients who are just had some surgery and you've your doctor has instructed for your loved one to accompany you the first two or three days, and you are a hallway patient, where is that loved one going to stay? Are you going to take your little cot and stay next to your loved one during the surgery in the hallway? I don't think that's appropriate, Mr. Speaker, and that's the point I'm making. We are allowing this particular government to shun away from the responsibility of addressing health care in our province, and we are seeing the escalation of a deteriorating health system, and it's inexcusable. And these are just a few examples, and you're going to see more of them as we enter into the 40 hours of debate on our budget as we move forward, Mr. Speaker. And I pointed out, Mr. Speaker, that uh, one of the things that really troubles me is the kidney dialysis machine, and I, I do respect the member from Barrington Argyle, who have, uh, six, have brought this up repeatedly here. And it also affects uh, the western part of uh, Shelburne County, which, uh, which I represent. And to me, there is no kidney dialysis machine in that immediate area. And when you see people that have to travel long distances to Yarmouth, for instance, in the dead of the winter, seniors people, that is unacceptable. That is simply unacceptable. And I applaud the announcements leading up to uh, election in just the last few weeks. We've seen announcements uh, in Digby. We've seen announcements across, the, across our province. But they were all in liberal writings. And to me, I simply ask the question, isn't the life, the value of these other patients that are looking for this service of kidney dialysis machine to have a satellite division in their community? It's simply unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what is interesting, and again, this falls in the category that the, the, the baby boomer iceberg is moving through our system. Mr. Speaker, there's an interesting statistic that uh, I think is very noticeable and is going to create more pressure on one of the scenarios that I've just mentioned earlier. That each month, Mr. Speaker, 1,000 Nova Scotians reach the age of 65. And, Mr. Speaker, I can, I can attest to the fact that uh, I'm getting closer, ever closer to uh, that particular uh, that number myself. I may be uh, I'm just doing the math here quickly, but 14 or 16 months away from that. But it's interesting to note on my personal life, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we have roughly less than a million people in this province. We have the aging populations of 1,000 people reaching 65 per month. And the interesting fact that I'm saying is, is that the young people may not need those services. In my personal life, I just did a routine physical every year or two for whatever, medical for, uh, for my work or whatever, and I usually did not uh, attend the hospital or the doctor service on a frequent basis. But now I'm in that group, Mr. Speaker, and I suggest that it's to do with that aging number. So I think that we need to address the seriousness of this situation of our health care crisis, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, especially in Nova Scotia, and certainly who do we believe? And Mr. Speaker, after a, a good night's rest, you know, the answer came to me. And the answer I was what I was trying to debate back and forth that I've heard the Premier say that there's no crisis. And I know that I did my best to kind of uh, disregard that approach and say, there is. There is. And so I come up with, a con I thought, was a, a, 
ingenious way of solving this, Mr. Speaker. And this is, this is the homework. This is the homework that I'm asking the backbenchers of the Liberal government and the ministers, if they want to be involved, to answer just this question. And Mr. Speaker, you know how I came upon finding the real answer to this? Mr. Speaker, after a good night's rest, the answer just came to me. We have a definite opinion between opposition and the Premier. Let's ask the 106,000 people that don't have a doctor if there's a crisis in the health care system. Let's ask the people who are affected by no doctors. Isn't that a brilliant idea, Mr. Speaker, that all the members, the backbenchers, and the present government can go and they can justify whether the Premier is on the right track or not, or the opposition. Now, I'm willing to bet, Mr. Speaker, that the people affected will vouch and say, yeah, yes, there is a crisis. And the people waiting for three or four years for hip replacements, the people, the backbenchers, or the Liberal government contacting them, people on the gurneys and the hallways, I'm willing to bet that my survey will say 19 times out of 20 that the member from Queen Shelburne is on the right track. There is a crisis. I'm, so we'll, I'm looking forward, Mr. Speaker, to come next week. And I know that uh, the members opposite has been taking thorough notes. They're going to go out to their constituencies over the weekend. They're going to do their homework. They're going to ask those peoples that may be on the hallways, in the gurneys, the 106,000 people without a doctor, and they're going to do a survey and bring that information back. And I look forward to it. I look forward to their presentation and uh, debate on this particular question because it, it really is a question of what is happening to a health care system. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting that we have painted that scenario. And my next question, Mr. Speaker, could the Premier be wrong? Now, in saying that there's no crisis in health care, it's an interesting question. And has the, prom has the Premier been wrong before? Another interesting question. And, well, Mr. Speaker, I... I uh, I asked that question and I did some research last night and um, while I was watching a hockey game, and, but I was more interested in getting the answer to this question. Has the Premier been wrong before, Mr. Speaker? He was wrong, Mr. Speaker, when he came to seniors' pharma care program. I remember that one, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure if I jog the memories of uh, the, the, the members opposite, they will remember that because I think one of the reasons why they will remember it is because the Premier in the government, uh, government office had to spend $115,000 to mail out apologies of letters to the seniors regarding the PharmaCare program. I remember that. Now, when you send out an apology, to me, you are accepting that you are wrong. So there's one incident right there, Mr. Speaker, that we have declared that the Premier does make mistakes Order, in the please. last... Order, please. Could I ask all members to keep the chatter down? The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne has the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and certainly you are doing a good job controlling the uh, anticipation of the members opposite. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the mandate of uh, the Premier for three and a half years is promised to break Nova Scotia's power monopoly. And it's still there. I think that, has that been wrong? So I would say there's another wrong. He promised to protect workers' rights and issued, he issued an open letter in 2013 and we have both opposition's bills, as I mentioned earlier, to repeal Bill 75. We have teachers' unions headed to the courts. And again, I think he broke a promise, and he is wrong here too, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
The same Premier promised last election a doctor for every Nova Scotians. And as today, I've said a number of times, 106,000 people in Nova Scotia are without. And I truly believe that the Premier is wrong here too. Mr. Speaker, I feel that there is a trend here. Perhaps the Premier may be in denial or refusing to upset his facts. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to, uh, again, want to ask the home workers or the backbenchers to uh, do, the, uh, do the homework and make sure they contact the, the people who have, have no doctors over the weekend. Mr. Speaker, uh, I look forward to the uh, next 40 hours of debate on this budget, and I look forward to uh, my colleagues' address on the health care, and I truly believe that we can put... Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm the, uh, I have got some nice comments, and uh, I, just need a, I just need a few minutes to get to them. Okay. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I got my I got my notes here. I got my notes in case there was some hack, some hackling some hackling from the uh, from the uh, present government, and I, I used it. I just used some key words, Mr. Speaker, and I, I can control the hackling. And uh, it's, it's it's a simple technique that I've learned in the last 11 years, Mr. Speaker, and I can use certain words that I can shut these people down within 20 seconds. And let's try it, Mr. Speaker. Here's, here's my words, and all I got to do is mention, when I have heckling from the uh, government party, is mention one bill, Bill 75, Mr. Speaker. And instantly, like we heard uh, several weeks ago in February, all the members just simply sat in silence. They didn't speak, and the Premier was left in a police escort with tinted SUV and they didn't participate. And notice how that worked, Mr. Speaker. It's a magic paper. It's a magic paper. They did not participate in Bill 75. They become silent. And soon as I pick that up and talk about that particular bill, the hush goes over the crowd. And I can continue on with my speech, Mr. Speaker, which I'm getting close to winding down. No. Mr. Speaker, I am looking forward to 40 hours of debate on this budget, and I made note here that health care, in my 11 years of presence here, health care got the majority of time in this chamber. It's one of the top issues of the whole budget process, and it's certainly an important issue. I'll, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to uh, proceed, but I'll, I'll continue talking about Bill 75 if the member keeps interrupting. And, you know, <laughs> it's, his, it's his choice. But I, lo I really look forward, I look forward to my honored colleagues for uh, addressing health care. They have got more wealth of knowledge than I have. I truly believe, and this is the part here that's interesting all members, I truly believe, regardless of what political party that you belong to, we are put on this earth to take care of each other. That is, a, that is a strong statement. Mr. Speaker, I truly believe, I truly believe in universal health care for every Canadian. And I truly believe we are entering a health care crisis under this Liberal government. And I want to say that I look forward to the next 40 hours of debate because I want to see the opposition, their rebuttal to my comments, and I look forward to the uh, honor of uh, the members here in my caucus because they have, uh, they're, they're very well and they can do a much thorough job. So Mr. Speaker, I'm getting close to winding down and I want to just close on this. I spent 11 years in this chamber. I have the appreciation of, uh, yeah, there you go. Just, 
Just before I close, Mr. Speaker, the member from Yarmouth has uh, introduced a new thought in my process. I'll reflect <laughs> over that. I'll reflect over that. I'll reflect over that uh, as, I, as I drive home four more years. But Mr. Speaker, it has truly been a privilege, privilege to uh, sit here in this chamber. And uh, I just want to say that I'm a simple fisherman that had an opportunity that very few people get in this society. And to come here, and I really appreciate uh, meeting all you people. And if I'm not here in my role as I am today, I hope that you see me as a friend. And uh, I wish you all well. And uh, I believe that we may be on the eve of election. Good health, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your time. concludes the response to the budget speech from the recognized opposition parties. The estimates are now referred to the Committee of the Whole on Supply. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, before we conclude the business for today, um, as Leader of the Opposition, as a fellow Opposition Leader to the NDP Leader in the House, certainly on behalf of our, our side and I invite a member on the government side to also just recognize the moment. Uh, I know we, people come and go from this place. Some are changed by it, sometimes good ways, sometimes not good ways. Others are not, they're the same person uh, when they retire as they were when they came in. I think we can say with certainty that that is true of the member for Queen's Shelburne and as leader of my party uh, and a fellow MLA, and as someone who I think I can say does consider him a friend, I just want to thank him for his years of service, first and foremost to his constituents, some of whom are my in-laws, uh, and secondly to all Nova Scotians for his time in this place as leader of the NDP in the House. And I invite all members to join me in, welcome, in thanking him and wishing him a very happy retirement. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Aquaculture. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'm not going to speak about the budget today. But uh, I do want to uh, also pass on uh, my finest wishes to uh, Sterling Bellavo. I don't know, I'm not supposed order, to say please. the name in here. Order, please. I'd like to remind the Honourable Member. <laughs> I believe the chair has been challenged, but uh, we'll move on. The, the Honourable Member for Agriculture and Fisheries and Aquaculture. I apologize, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and indeed I thought it was appropriate in this case. Uh, being a former Minister of Fisheries, and, uh, and he did a great job in that role, and also Sterling, uh, Sterling the Honourable Member, I'll get it right this time, the Honourable Member uh, I've, I've known for years and years. And uh, he did very well representing the communities and the fishing industry. And when I was fisheries minister years ago, he was in, the, in, that, in that field and did a great job representing the fishing industry and the fishermen in this province. I want to personally thank you for doing that, and I know the industry does too. And it's very special to have you here in the legislature. And it's, uh, it's sad when you see someone go that has in their heart things that you, that you have to help the industry and help the province of Nova Scotia. So I know whatever you do in the future, that uh, you'll do it very well. And it's been an honor and a pleasure for me to know you. And my colleagues say the same thing about you. You, you. you conduct yourself very well here, as you always have in your life. And congratulations on retirement. I should have done the same thing, maybe. But uh, I'm still a long ways away from that. But uh, it, it's wonderful to work here. It's wonderful to have people with your character and determination to do things to, uh, to set in this house. Again, thank you, Sterling, Mr. Honourable Member, and uh, we'll be good friends for many years to come. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for those kind words from the Minister of Fisheries. And certainly, uh, my colleague here from Shelburne, Queens, deserves the recognition. And I would like to say on behalf of the NDP caucus, and I know from his constituents, that we want to thank him for all that he has given. And I can tell you my experience with this gentleman, and he is a gentleman, I can tell you that. It has been a great experience for me to uh, watch him and be a mentor to me, Mr. Speaker. And I know during one of the most stressful um, situations in the House, when we were trying to um, tire out the government by continuing and continuing and ringing the bells. I had such a grand time being the whip at that time and I could just ring the bells as, as long as I wanted to. What power, hey? And Sterling wrote me this fabulous note that I will have forever and I'm going to get it laminated and it said, stay focused. And so I would like to offer that piece of advice to everyone here because we do know that we're on the eve of an election and I think that that was most incredible advice for all of us is to stay focused on the job that needs to be done and I know that uh, the words that I have today are not enough to say the appreciation that we have for this fine gentleman and what he has offered to Nova Scotia and has offered to us as a caucus. So I would like to say thank you, Sterling. I will stay focused, and we love you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to rise with my other colleagues to wish the member well. I had the opportunity of being a fisheries cricket critic with him, a fisheries critic to him, and found that he was always an individual that you could work with, who certainly had the best interest of the industry and the people of Nova Scotia at heart. And I know that we all owe him a great thanks, and many have said that tonight. But I think, Mr. Speaker, that I would like to also thank his family for allowing him to be a member of the House of Assembly, for giving up many different family occasions to do the work as, not only as an MLA, but as a Minister of the Crown. Because as most of us here realize, this is not a job that you go into if you don't have the support of your family. And I think that as much as I praise Sterling for what he's done, the member for what he's done, I also want to thank his family for what they've done for the province of Nova Scotia. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Deputy House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That uh, completes the government's business for today, and I, I have to say that's a, a pretty fine note to complete it on, to uh, honour uh, one of their long-serving members in that way. But uh, I will uh, move that we adjourn the House till Monday, May 1st at 4 p.m. We'll uh, sit between the hours of 4 p.m. and 10 p.m., and we'll call Government Business uh, Committee of the whole House on supply. With that, I move that the uh, House do adjourn till Monday at 4 p.m., May the 1st. The motion is that the House rise to meet again on Monday, May 1st, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. Would those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay? Aye. The motion is carried. We stand adjourned until Monday, May 1st, between the hours of 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. <laughs>